Okay. Um, just to quickly go over our agenda for this morning. Um, uh, I will bring up our slide deck in a couple of minutes and talk about why we're here. How the data that we're collecting today will be used and presented to decision makers. Go over our meeting protocols, including a review of panelists roles. My role as a moderator, um, participant and listener roles, and then review the meeting format. Then we'll um, start with some uh, introductions that will largely happen in the chat box as we find ourselves now in the virtual environment. And then we'll begin with um, panel introductions. Give each panel member uh, a few minutes to um, give a little bit of history on their background and their interest in this topic. And then at 10 a.m., uh, if not sooner, we'll begin our moderated panel discussion. We do have five questions that we will pose to our panel this morning. At 11, we will begin our moderated question and panel response session. Excuse me. And then we will conclude with a summary um, wrap up and next steps. And we do hope to adjourn at 12.15. Um, one thing I'd like to offer today is that because this is a complex topic and we are fortunate to have the experts on our panel that we do this morning, there's a possibility that the moderated panel discussion may run over by a few minutes. If that happens, we have a couple of options. Um, that is to reduce the amount of time for audience questions or we can um, continue the meeting until 12.15. So I think we'll just kind of play it by ear um, and uh, uh, be prepared to be agile moving moving into that part of the, the discussion this morning. So with that, I'll go ahead and bring up the PowerPoint for this meeting today and get it into the correct viewing mode. Whoops, excuse me, I did not mean to do that. My apologies. So I'll go ahead and begin now. Again, good morning, everyone. This is the LCB Deliberative Dialogue on Cannabis Plant Chemistry. Welcome to our panelists today and all members of the public who have joined us for this session. My name is Kathy Hoffman, and I'm the Policy and Rules Manager for the LCB. Joining me today from LCB and helping me with um, slides, notes, and many other things are Audrey Basic and Jeff Kildall. Um, our Agency Policy and Rules Coordinators, and Justin Nordhorn, our Director of Policy and External Affairs. Kendra Hodgson, our Marijuana Examiner's Unit Manager, and Nick Pullman, our Agency Chemist, um, along with our Administrative Professional, Tierney Hamilton. Um, I'd like to get us situated and ready to begin this forum today. As a reminder, since this is a public work session, I want to make sure that everyone understands that the recording of this session and the chat function are public record. So we ask that you are mindful about what you share in the chat box. Materials for this meeting were distributed by Gov Delivery on May 12th, and they've been continuously available on the LCB Law Rules and Statement website. And that's located at um, www.lcb.wa.gov law and rules um, since that time, actually. Our messaging also uh, provided a way to respond or provide questions, excuse me, in advance by June 1. And we did not receive any questions for today's panel in advance by June 1. We currently have an hour set aside on the agenda for attendees to pose questions to the panel. And I've discussed how that time may adjust somewhat if you do wish to pose a cannabis plant chemistry question to the panel, 
please use the chat box to offer your questions. Staff will monitor the chat box and will offer questions to the panel in the order received. And again, we are only talking about plant cannabis, I mean, I'm sorry, cannabis plant chemistry today. But before we move into situating ourselves for this dialogue, I'd like to speak more broadly to the process. One of the basic ground rules for participation in deliberative dialogue, and those who have been shared uh, or who have reviewed our agenda and other materials, is that dialogue participants speak for themselves and not as representatives of others' interests. We seek to and want to provide an unrestricted flow of information without any bottlenecks to inform all of us. Allowing this process, allowing for this, makes this process more useful for all of us. We selected our panelists for today's sessions based on their expertise in cannabis plant chemistry from varying perspectives. And we developed today's panel questions with our panelists to begin what we hope will be a meaningful, meaningful dialogue used to inform our pathway forward. We are all well aware of the positions of industry associations representing licensed cannabis businesses, but we're also well aware that interest and indeed concern around cannabis plant chemistry extends beyond LCB licensees. So this forum today is designed to make space for all voices and perspectives to be heard because we do value all voices and we strive to create opportunities to be shared throughout the session. So it's important to us that this is a collaborative and transparent process. And while we do need to be mindful of the agenda, we hope that this deliberative dialogue session will encourage us all to freely listen, think, and explore new ideas together. So, a couple things before we move into the next section of the discussion. As a reminder, we ask that you don't use the chat box for anything that could be construed as bullying or harassing. During previous deliberative dialogue sessions that we've hosted, that conduct occurred. And if it occurs today, we will close the chat box to all participants. And you may raise your hand if you wish to ask a question pertaining to the topic during the appropriate segment. I also want to draw your attention to the mute and unmute buttons. Panelists and others, please remember to keep you, yourself on mute when not speaking. And when you do wish to speak, please make sure you're unmuted. Uh, please note the video icon and we ask that to the extent possible, panel members use the video icon because it helps with engagement. For other participants, we ask that you keep your cameras off until you've been called upon to speak. So I'd like to move into the slide deck and our meeting intentions. And it looks like this is not gonna work this morning, pardon me. So again, our overall meeting goal today is to build an understanding of cannabis plant chemistry perspectives. Our intentions are to provide a platform for panelists to share and discuss plant chemistry perspectives, increase an opportunity for us to engage in moderated dialogue, and begin that dialogue to um, inform THC compound other than Delta 9 rule and policy development. So why are we here today? Um, the agency issued policy statement, and that's PS 2101 concerning THC compounds other than Delta 9 on April 28, 2021. We began rule development by way of inquiry on May 12th, 2021. So that's the just opening this uh, topic to considering rules in the future. And we're here because we'd like to begin a discussion concerning cannabis plant chemistry to inform rule and policy development in the future. And I want to pause here um, and check in with. Um, Justin Nordhorn, anything that you'd like to add, Justin? Sure, good morning, everyone. Um, for those uh, who haven't met me, I'm Justin Nordhorn, the Policy Director uh, for the Liquor and Cannabis Board. And, you know, th these are really important uh, dialogues for us to be able to uh, listen to and engage with 
uh, as this is an ever-changing topic uh, all across the United States. We're, we're in uh, a lot of communication with other states uh, and regulators across the nation, and this is a topic that is um, uh, being engaged uh, all over and even internationally. So, um, you know, it's really important that we have dignity and respect for one another, uh, hearing each other's perspectives so we can get a full wide range of, of understanding where people uh, are coming from without um, uh, any type of bullying, uh, as uh, Kathy had pointed out. And also, uh, we, we certainly want to have this not only inform our opportunity for rulemaking and, and as we develop these rules, but what are the gaps that we need to be able to address with the legislature and uh, to be able to you know, facilitate a reasonable um, set of rules and reasonable regulations around these topics as we move forward. So not only uh, will this inform us in our rulemaking process, but also inform the LCB where do we need to go with any type of legislative requests and how do we work with stakeholders to accomplish those particular goals? So I'd like to recognize that this is not just our, our uh, licensees uh, and the experts on the panel, but we also, I understand, have folks here that I'd like to thank from uh, local health uh, who are interested in, in these issues and state health, uh, as well as uh, cities uh, representatives uh, that have joined the, the dialogue today to listen in and, and learn on these issues and also our colleagues from Canada. Uh, so, you know, uh, I'd like to uh, especially welcome uh, that international dialogue and so we can really learn from one another and uh, make the best reasonable policy that we can as we move forward. So thank you all um, and we appreciate uh, the positive engagement. Uh, let's assume positive intent and uh, and have an open mind as we talk uh, specifically about the uh, chemistry of the plant today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justin. Um, no, we already went over this um, in the agenda, but if you joined us at 9.35, um, comments received today will be added to an Excel workbook organized by theme and analyzed. That's really our agency practice when we engage in these kinds of um, opportunities to work with you or stakeholders and many others. Those comments will be presented to the board for review and discussion. And then we do share our recordings and our comments tables externally. So I want to go over our meeting uh, protocol really quickly here. We have five excellent panels with us today. Um, they will be engaging in conversation for the first hour of the meeting, hopefully, maybe a little longer. My role as the moderator is to um, pose questions and then offer follow up questions. Also, want to share that Nick Pullman, our agency chemist, will be co moderating with me today um, to uh, kind of help the scientific conversation along and maybe help me bridge some gaps. And then Participant and listener role, those are the folks in our audience, and that is to listen, um, we hope, for the first hour and then be able to um, uh, provide questions that, that uh, emerge for you during the question section of today's deliberative dialogue. So I just want to touch on what deliberative dialogue is, especially, um, I, I know that this probably isn't something everyone engages with in every day, but I found a really nice quote. And if anyone is um, listening in on the telephone, I just want to read it to you if you can't see it. Deliberative dialogue differs from other forms of public discourse, such as debate, negotiation, brainstorming, and consensus building, because the objective is not so much to talk together as it is to think together, not so much to reach a conclusion as to discover where a conclusion might lie. Thinking together involves listening deeply to other points of view, exploring new ideas and perspectives, searching for points of agreement, and bringing unexamined assumptions into the open. Um, I have the link here. I'm happy to share the slide deck if folks want to learn or understand more about deliberative dialogue. Um, I wanted to offer this slide as well, just to make, distinguish between the difference between deliberative dialogue and debate. Don't want to spend a lot of time here, but there, there is a clear distinction there, and I want to make sure that we're focusing on the deliberative dialogue piece of our discussion today. Um, ground rules for deliberative dialogue. Again, 
first of all, we're here to to learn from each other. So this isn't something that anyone can win or lose. Not a debate. There are no right answers. Um, everyone speaks for themselves. In dialogue, everyone is treated as an equal. So we ask that um, status and stereotype. It's OK to it, once you leave the firm, great, but um, just hoping everyone can be on equal footing here. Encourage everyone to be open and listen to others, especially if you disagree. Um, identify and test assumptions, even your own. Um, and listen carefully and respectfully to other points of view. Um, we're looking for common ground here. We really do respect all points of view. My and Nick's role will be to objectively guide the discussion. And again, just as a reminder, since this is a public work session, anything shared has the potential to become part of a public record. So our format for today, um, our panelists will take about five minutes to introduce themselves. Um, then we'll begin the moderated discussion um, with our panelists and the participants listen during this segment. And then after that segment, we were imagining about an hour, maybe more, um, we will have moderated participant questions and panel responses. So when we get to that section, please use the hand raise feature to indicate that you have, have a question and participants will be called on in the order received. So at this point, I um, would love to hear who's joining us today. Um, in the chat box, if you can provide us with your name, um, share who you are affiliated with or represent, if you're comfortable sharing that at this point, and why you're interested in the topic that we'll be discussing in our deliberative dialogue today. And I want to give, uh, let's see, oh, it's about three or four minutes for that, maybe less. Okay. It looks like we have a few more introductions trickling in. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, panelists, if you want to go ahead and turn on your cameras for us. Great, thank you so much. All right, and we will go ahead and begin with panelists introductions now. So um, let's start with Jessica. My name is Hi. Jessica Tanani. I am the CEO of Vertibio Research. We were the first uh, group in the state of Washington to get a cannabis research license. Um, we have collaborated with a number of companies, universities, and even federal labs. And I think I'm here today because we've done a lot of work on the genomics of cannabis, um, including releasing a couple of cannabis genomes. And genetics of cannabis dictates some cannabinoid synthesis, but not all. So um, I think that's the purpose that I'm here today to discuss. Great. Thanks very much, Jessica. Uh, Brad. Thank you, Kathy. Hello, everyone. My name is Brad Douglas, and it's good to see some familiar names in the participant list. Looking forward to the conversation today. My background is in organic medicinal chemistry. I'm trained as an organic medicinal chemist. Professionally, I have over a decade of experience as an FDA affairs consultant, particularly dealing with food and dietary ingredient legality and how FDA and other global regulators deal with synthetics. Uh, since joining the cannabis industry over about a decade ago, I've worked with 
the company called the workshop. Uh, at the workshop, we do everything from testing, and I've served as a lab director in the past, and the production of processes for extracting, purifying, and manufacturing cannabinoids and cannabis products. So it's great to be here today. Great, glad to have you, Brad. Um, David. Hi, uh, my name is David Gang. I'm a professor at Washington State University over in Pullman. Um, I've been there for a number of years, over a decade. I was trained as a plant biochemist slash chemist. I'm the former president of the Phytochemical Society of North America, which is a um, large society of researchers interested in the chemistry of plants of various types. I've worked on medicinal plants for pretty much all of my career. Um, in terms of researching, understanding what they do, what they make, and how they do all of those things. Um, I'm also currently the assistant director of the Agricultural Research Center, or the, what we call the Connors Office of Research at WSU. Um, and in that role, I've been kind of listed as a point person for topics related to cannabis, both uh, policy issues that are Im of importance and interest to our college, as well as research related to hemp. As many of you may know, the university is still uh, limited in what we could do with non-hemp related cannabis research. Uh, we have to follow within um, pretty strict guidelines associated with DEA licenses and things like that. Um, but things have opened up for hemp, so we do a lot of work moving in, in the hemp direction a lot. And of course, this discussion today, that's going to be an interesting topic because of the, you know, the, it's really the same species. It's just been differentiated into different types. And the chemistry that we're talking about today is actually pretty important for that. Great. Thank you very much. Discussion. Appreciate it. Glad you're here. Uh, Nuffy. Yeah. yeah. Hi, everyone. So my name is Dr. Nafi Stella. I'm a professor at the University of Washington. I have uh, studied cannabinoid research for about 25 years. So I've been through uh, the early days and, and, and the legalization and, and followed. My area of expertise, I'm a pharmacologist. So I think about how cannabinoids will affect our body, our brain, our body. And uh, I'm mainly interested in trying to understand and optimize the medical properties of cannabis. And, and to do so, we need to understand if there's some toxicity or side effects. And I'm very happy today to try to help with uh, the current research in cannabinoid research. Great, thank you. Very glad you're here as well. And Amber. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Amber Wise and my background is in Chemistry, I have a PhD in chemistry and I was a professor in undergrad institutions for a number of years. Um, I did some toxicology and public health research during my postdoc uh, that I think gives me some interesting perspectives. And I've been in the cannabis industry for just going on five years now. Um, and I'm here, I think, as uh, I'm a science director at Medicine Creek Analytics currently, if you're not aware which is a third-party testing lab um, here in Washington State. And so I'm hoping to shed some light on some of the nuances behind uh, analytics and, and detection and, and some of that with, with regards to some of these compounds. All right, thanks very much, Amber. Um, and Nick, uh, are you able to turn on your camera so you can join us? Yeah, absolutely. Thank uh, you. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, Nick Pullman. Uh, I'm the chemist for Washington State Liquor and Canvas Board. Um, I work primarily with the third party testing labs, but I do a, a lot of the science for the agency, I guess, in a, in a broad standpoint. Great. So thanks for, thanks for helping me moderate today, Nick. Appreciate it very much. All right, so with that, uh, with that, we'll go ahead and move into our questions for our panelists. So our first question, and we'll start with Nephi. Um, how do the effects of Delta-8 differ from those of Delta-9 THC and other TH isomers? 
does it matter if the compound is produced in plants or chemicals? Okay, thank you. Um, I thought I addressed this question by going over five quick points. So I think it'll take me six to eight minutes. Uh, the first thing I wanna do is to do a quick summary so that everybody understands the current under uh, scientific research that is available on, on these compounds. And then I'll go over some specifics on how it affects the brain and, and maybe our body. And I'll touch upon the third thing on the source of the material. And then I will explain a little bit better uh, what cannabinoids are and how we have to think about Delta 8 and, and Delta 10. So to, to start, just to give everybody um, the current uh, understanding on, on Delta 8, Delta 10, which I will be comparing to Delta 9, is um, what I'll be saying is based on peer-reviewed scientific uh, papers that have been published in the field. And the cannabinoid field research has started in the, in the 60s. So we have 50 years of really uh, a small number, but high quality uh, papers, at least for the time that they were doing these experiments. So as a pharmacologist, I think about small molecules. So uh, what you're seeing on, on, on the deck here is the small molecules. So how does Delta 9 differ from Delta 8? And you can see that the, uh, it's a very small chemical difference, which has been highlighted here in red with, by the circle. So there's a very small difference in terms of, of the chemistry. So I think about the molecule and then I think about how it travels in our body and then how does it affect uh, the brain or our body. And, and most of the time we think in terms of how does it affect the body, how does it affect the immune system? So uh, we need to understand how the molecule will affect our body. We need to understand how much dose, how much is taken uh, what kind of what we call formulation? Is it in the form of a pill or is it in a liquid? And is it through the stomach orally or through the lungs? And that might actually produce differences in the biological effect. And then uh, those are the kind of, of questions that the field is asking to try to understand the differences between all these uh, molecules. And once we understand how it works in, at the body level, we need to, we can even understand how these molecules work at the very small level, at the molecular level. So this very small molecule will actually interact with a, with a protein, which is called the cannabinoid receptors. And when this molecule interacts with this receptor, just like a key lock, it will open up some biological response, either in the brain or, or, or in the body. So those are the kind of things that our, the scientific field is, is questioning or is, is researching to try to understand the differences between all these, um, these compounds. So the, the third thing I just wanted to uh, go over is the source of these molecules. So the cannabinoids or phytocannabinoids produced by the plant um, our, our, the plant grows and then we can extract it. So that's one way that we can actually get the molecule or the molecule can be exactly the same molecule can be uh, synthesized in the laboratory or um, one could actually invent a new molecule. And that's what we actually were discussing. Could, we'll be talking about what is an artificial molecule. So in terms of the pharmacologist, when we try to understand uh, the, the response, what does this molecule do in our body? Um, in our eyes, whether it's produced by the plant or with this, whether it's produced chemically in the laboratory, if the molecule is 100% pure, either from the plant or the lab, in, most, in, in our uh, perspective, this molecule will produce the same biological effect. So I just wanted to tackle that point versus plant versus um, synthetic. So the first, the fourth part I wanted to uh, cover are the cannabinoid compounds. So the main cannabinoid compound that has been studied over those 50 years was Delta-9-THC. This is the, the, the molecule 
that is um, has been legalized and produces some effects on our body that can be differentiated on the brain or uh, on the entire body. And then I would say probably 10 or 15 years ago, the field has started to study uh, cannabidiol or even mixtures of Delta-9 and cannabidiol together and try to understand what kind of biological response these molecules will, will produce. And now we know that Delta-9 THC and cannabidiol produce very different biological responses because they work through very different mechanisms. So that's where the field is when we think about Delta-9 THC and cannabidiol. And we not only think about what these molecules do on their effect on the brain, how they will be relaxing or changing your sensation or affecting your, your ability to, uh, to uh, move or, or, or be um, alert. But we also uh, think about the side effects of Delta-9 THC and particularly in the context of the vulnerable population, for example, the adolescents where their body really might actually have some uh, detrimental effects from taking regularly Delta-9 THC. Cannabidiol has a very different uh, um, profile and has much more uh, medicinal properties that are, are interesting and still uh, need to be, uh, I think, discovered. So this is kind of where the field is, what we've studied for 50 years, try to understand what does Delta-9 THC does, what does cannabidiol does, and now to my fifth point, which is the, goal, the, the central question of, of this panel, is what does Delta-8 and Delta-10 do? And, and frankly, the field has not paid much attention to, at least the scientific field, to these two molecules. And the only, as I said, peer-reviewed papers, what is currently available are in the literature are a handful of papers that were produced in the 80s that were studying what Delta-8 was doing. And um, there's really not much research that has been done because the main result that they found in the 80s is that the biological activity of Delta-8 is very similar to the biological activity of Delta-9. And if, it, it, if you read the paper a little bit in more detail, maybe Delta-8 would be a more mild Delta-9 with maybe a portion of the effect and maybe the duration a little bit differently. So frankly, the field has not paid too much attention to Delta-8 because it does almost the same thing as Delta-9 in our initial view of the molecule. When cannabidiol arrived, it produced a completely different biological response and the scientific field um, was very interested in trying to understand. So I guess just to conclude, I guess uh, the current understanding of the pharmacology between the Delta uh, of Delta-8 and, and truly there's almost, I, I had a hard time finding publication peer-reviewed papers on Delta-10. So I think the, the question is, is quite open in, in this regard. So just to conclude, uh, the, the, um, the field, our field of research has very limited information that is uh, several decades old on what is the biological activity of Delta-8. And I think we have, uh, we have today the research, the tools that are in uh, much more uh, precise where we could actually uh, engage into some research to understand a little bit better how it works. So Great, thank you. Give a, a, a perspective. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Greatly appreciate it. Um, any, any feedback from panel members? Anything you'd like to add? It's, it's, it's my understanding a lot of those earlier papers were kind of on medical, like pediatric patients and things like that, that may want a, a less psychotropic effect for then Delta 9. Is that, is that kind of a fair assessment? Well, the one paper that I know of was actually, use, was differentiating the psychotropic effects 
It's actually a really interesting paper from the 80s because they provide some definition of what psychotropic or uh, uh, means. How does it affect your brain? And therefore, they have some definitions, for example, changing your sensory awareness, liking music or relaxation, or even some medical properties at the, at the beginning, like for sleep. But, um, but no, they were truly trying to, to compare the, the, uh, the psychotropic, the effect on the brain of, of at least of the one that I know that has been peer reviewed. Okay. Others. Kathy, I'd like to say something also um, that Nephi kind of alluded to this, and we're going to go into it a little bit more detail, but I think it's appropriate to talk about it here. Uh, you know, the second part of the question here is, does it matter if it is produced in plants or chemically? Um, and I think Nephi did a really good job of describing that if it's the same molecule, it really doesn't matter where it comes from. It's the same molecule. But what's interesting is that the plant produces this, what we'd say enzymatically, that's kind of my field, biochemistry. They have special little, you know, the proteins, they're like little machines that make certain things and they only make a certain type of these molecules. Kind of like we'd say, like the right-handed version. There's also another version that's a left-handed version that the plant doesn't make. But if you are a chemist making these in the lab, a lot of times that controlling the difference of being able to make the left or right-handed version is very difficult. And a lot of times you'll get a mixture of both of those. And this is something we'll talk about in more detail um, in response to one of the other questions, but it, it goes along with this one. And that is that if you don't have the ability to control that very well, and you don't have the ability to separate those two versions, you're going to have a mixture of two compounds. One of them will be active and the other one may have a completely different activity. So that's, that's an important consideration here is that how it's produced chemically you know, or synthetically in a lab can have a really big impact on what you actually end up with. Thank you. All right. I'd like Any to add something if I could, Kathy. Pardon me? I'd like to add something if I could, Kathy. Please, this is, that's what this panel is for. I, I wanted to elaborate a bit on what, what David just said and a bit of what Nephi went into in terms of biological effects. On one hand, we have physiological effects and perhaps psychotropic effects. Another aspect of biological effects is what the body does to a molecule. So those of you that are familiar with pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, know that you have metabolism and excretion. And we do have some data on how the body metabolizes delta-8 THC relative to delta-9 THC, and it's very similar. So you still have the pathway where you have 11 hydroxy compounds to 11 carboxy and it's excreted in the center. And that's a key point when it comes to understanding the safety of pumps. Um, so that's an important point, considering the relative differences and safety of Delta-8 versus Delta-9. Thank you. Uh, Nick, any, any follow-up? that you'd like to pose to the panel? Not necessarily, I just, I, you know, I, I think we've kind of talked about this, but I just want to make it clear is we are talking about for Delta-9 and Delta-8, they each have four enantiomers, and we are very specifically talking about one that the plant makes. We, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, panel, but I believe we're getting at that the other three enantiomers we really know nothing about. Is that, is that a fair statement? I think that's a very fair thing to say, yes. Agreed. Thank you. I agreed, I'll, simp I'll second that for sure. Hey Nick, for the non chemist, can you give a little bit of more detail on you know, the statement that you just uh, <laughs> yeah. translated for everybody that's on the call? Uh, Let's, let's try my best. Um, so there are, for both Delta-9 and Delta-8, there are uh, two stereocenters, meaning there are two areas in the molecule where I think David said there can be right-handed or left-handedness. Um, so you can have, essentially you can have right-right, right-left, left-right, and left-left. Uh, I believe we're talking about 
left left if I had to venture a guess there. But anyway, um, anyway, there's different handedness to the different molecules. That's what I mean by enantiomers. And the plant with its enzymes only makes one set of hands. The other three set of hands we know nothing about. They do get created chemically if you were trying to make these molecules. But as far as we know, and as far as the plant is concerned, there's there's nothing there for us to talk about, meaning that those other three sets, the other three enantiomers aren't available in the plant. And I think for the non-chemist here, what the significance there is it creates different three-dimensional shapes for the molecule in the end. So when we draw them on paper, like we see here on the slide, they look really, really similar, but in three-dimensional space, they take up different shapes. And so that means they bind to our receptors differently and have different activity, which gets back to the biological aspect of it. Yeah, it's kind of, I think of it like a lock and key kind of mechanism, and you might have like a stickier lock or stickier key, I guess, in the lock, um, I guess is an way I think of it. A, a good example that attendees might be familiar with, even if you're not familiar with chemistry, is the terpene carbone. So D-carbone smells like caraway, which is like your right hand, and L-carbone smells like mint. So it's just a very tangible understanding of how different handedness can affect properties that, that we sense or that affect us. Another way to think of it is like a hand in a glove. If you have a right-handed glove and a left-handed glove, right? Some gloves, like some of your latex gloves, you can put them on, doesn't matter, but some work gloves are really designed to go only on one hand, right? And that's that's kind of like the binding that Nephi said of this receptor, is the receptor is kind of like the glove. It's got a certain shape. And then the molecule is like the hand that has to fit in there. You can't put a left hand into a right-handed glove very well. It doesn't work. And so you don't get the same response. So all of these are just different ways to think about it. Hopefully, it'll make sense to people. One of these will make sense to the people that are listening. Give us some great analogies. I think I think one should fit for for some or all. <laughs> Thank you for those. Any follow up before we move into question two? All right. So moving on to the next slide here. So our next question, and this is the let's let's start with Amber on this. Um, when producing delta eight THC, what do and don't we know about byproducts? How do you detect these? How do we? How are these detected? So Amber, I think I'll you myself. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I have a, a couple different points to make here. These are obviously like pretty large questions. Um, but first of all, there are different steps along the pathway to making D Delta eight um, or Delta 10 or, or anything, right? And I think, you know, we'll clarify potentially the difference between an artificial molecule, which is you know, completely synthesized from something else versus something that's been extracted from a natural product and then something that's potentially been extracted and then transformed. Um, so if I'm gonna give the, you know, what I think is probably the most economically highly used transformation at the moment, which is, you know, converting CBD into Delta-8. And the different steps along that pathway are many, and there are many different ways to do every step. So first of all, you have to get the CBD out of the plant material, you could use crude CBD to, to, to then do the conversion. You could isolate the CBD further. Um, you can have distillate. You can have really pure, pure isolate as your starting material as the CBD. Then there's a conversion step from CBD to Delta-8. There's a whole bunch of ways you can do that, um, ranging from you know relatively safe and clean chemistries to things that I don't even want to mention here that I've seen on forums on the internet. Um, in terms of the chemicals that can be utilized to make this transformation. Um, and then after you make that transformation, you need to generally do some sort of cleanup on the finished product. And there are a number of steps there as well. And so there's many, many different ways to accomplish this chemistry. Um, and in terms of byproducts, I think of there being two categories. 
Um, one of them being uh, side reactions and chemistry that didn't go exactly as you think it does. For, for non-chemists, you know, if you're converting a, a pot, like a whole batch of molecules from one molecule to another, it's not 100% really ever. Um, and so what's happening, you know, sometimes you don't get any conversion, sometimes you get 50-50 conversion. And so the types of chemistry you're doing, how you're doing them, um, create side reactions and different chemistries from the starting material. So that's one kind of byproduct are potentially cannabinoids, but all kinds of other organic molecules that aren't necessarily cannabinoids that come out of these reactions, depending upon the reaction conditions. And then the other type of contaminant or byproduct that I think of are the leftovers from the chemistry steps, the residual solvents, the catalysts, the God knows what people are using in the process have all of those been removed from the final product? Um, and so, you know, the, to answer the sort of the second part is how are these detected? Um, well, the, first of all, the commercial labs in Washington state do not have the ability to identify or separate many of these just cannabinoid compounds, right? If we just talk about the side reaction chemistries, um, many of these molecules have the same molecular weight and, you know, we're seeing images that they're really similar. So separating these is very difficult. It's possible. Scientists can do it. Um, it's very expensive. It's very time consuming. And there aren't a lot of standardized methods or, or guidance for us to go on. So um, the, the other thing in that regard is, you know, Washington, commercial labs in Washington State can, if they're doing the chemistry correctly, separate and identify Delta-8, Delta-9. Uh, Delta-10, um, the standard for Delta-10 only just became commercially available in the last few months. Um, so, you know, our lab does not currently have a test for Delta-10. It takes weeks to months to develop that kind of thing. Um, but there are labs in Washington that I understand can detect Delta 10 and separate them. Um, and we're not even talking about all the other minor cannabinoids and other side reactions that could be seen as some of these molecules. And so without diving too much into it, if you're not doing your separation very well, you can get these molecules come out together. And so one peak of, that looks like Delta 8 might actually be a combination of Delta nine or some other side reaction products. Um, so there's a lot of complicated chemistry involved with the detection part. Um, and yeah, I think, I think I'll think i leave it there to some degree. Um, there's just, you know, a number of different ways to go from the starting plant material to a final product. And Many people are potentially doing this in a clean and safe and correct way using trained chemists. Um, and many people, I'm sure, um, particularly unregulated market, are doing this in garages and using internet forums as instructions. Um, and we're getting God knows what out as a product on the other side. So it's um, it's a spectrum, I think, of, of potential outcomes that we're seeing. And I'll, I think I'll leave it there. Amber, one of the, the, somebody told me an analogy on a panel I was on a while back about cooking eggs. You know, like if you scramble eggs, some people are really good at scrambling eggs, but other people can take the same eggs and like make something horrible. And so yes. from a chemistry perspective, you know, I, I like to think of it as like people having different quality in their production. And so it's not also like a one, you know, everybody doesn't make the same product if they're given the same eggs, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And even the way that you extract, you know, say we're talking about extracting CBD from the plant material first, and then using that product as your starting material. When you extract using CO2 or ethanol or butane, you get different, you know, groups of dominant molecules. And so then your starting material is different than somebody who might take that crude and then isolate the CBD into something really pure to start the product to, or the reaction from. And so if you start with a crude mixture using one extraction method, or if you start with a more pure mixture, you're going to end up with very different end products. And then there's other cleanup steps from there. Um, so it's, it's like a brand, like every time you do a step, there's like multiple pathways that you can take. Um, and I, I saw a reference, I have not had a chance to look it up, 
but somebody put a paper out recently from, uh, uh, I believe it's a government lab that had ways that you could, like a forensics lab could detect the, the byproducts that are in a particular um, product and figure out the chemistry they used to make that product, right? So if you're using battery acid instead of trichloroacetic acid, you would get different dominant end products or different contaminants in the end mixture. And so there are ways that people can, you know, investigate this stuff, but it's very time consuming. It's very high end chemistry. It's very expensive. Um, so your average, you know, lab that is designed to test flour or concentrate for a specific set of molecules in a very prescribed way, because we have accreditation to do it a specific way, can't just all of a sudden change up our chemistry to see these molecules that we have yet to even necessarily identify very well. Kathy, I'd like to add something too to that. Um, to I know we're talking about the science, we're not talking about policy, but one of the things that I think everybody is on the same page with, and that is safety is important. And we're going to have to deal with, you know, how we make policies around safety. But from the scientific perspective, you know, what what is a safe mixture? What is the safe product? Um, how do you know that you have something that's actually safe? That's, that's one of the things that's actually quite difficult to understand and figure out in a lot of in a lot of times. Um, maybe another analogy. We're doing lots of analogies today, so I'll throw out another one. Um, and this goes along with what Emma just said, and that is how do you detect and how do you measure what we have? And she mentioned that the, the fact that we have certain standard methods for measuring cannabinoids in the state labs, the state accredited labs, right? And it's kind of like the technology there, it's it's good, solid, robust technology. It works, but it's also very limited in what it can tell you. And it's a good comparison would be that that would be the technology there is kind of like a television set from the 1970s, okay, a CRT TV which gives you an image, it's like a 20 inch screen and gives you a resolution of about 200 by 100, something like that, right? It's great for watching shows like I Love Lucy or Chips or whatever else these old you know, TV shows were, they were designed for that. But now imagine you're trying to go, if you go into Costco today and you see these 8K Ultra HD TVs and you can stand there and watch somebody doing one of these base jump flights through the, you know, through the fjords in Norway and you can see the details of the flowers as they fly by them. The TV is so amazing in detail and how much they can see and how much you can you can image with those. But now take that same base jump flight and put it on that old TV. What are you going to see? Well, you'll see that there's mountains there and you'll see that somebody's kind of flying along, right? Now, so you know what's going on, you know it's there, but all of those details, you just can't see them. And that's kind of like the technology that we're dealing with here too, is that if you want to find out what those problem compounds might be, what the safety issues might be, because you've got interesting from a chemist perspective, interesting chemistry going on that doesn't give you the product you want, give you side reactions. If you don't have the ability to see those, you're not gonna know they're there. And from a user's perspective, somebody out in the community, somebody may say, I've got this certificate analysis that says, here's my, you know, we looked at 12 cannabinoids, here's the levels of these. We looked at a bunch of terpenoids, here's a level of these. Therefore, you know that what you're, you're looking at or taking is safe. But that's like looking at it through that 1970s TV set, right? There may be other things in there that you just cannot see with that type of analysis that may or may not have a safety impact on the person that's going to be using whatever that product is. And that's an important thing to think about here, right? It doesn't mean that that technology is bad. It's not. It's good. It's very useful. But there are other technologies that was mentioned earlier. It's very expensive and very time consuming to get that 8K resolution. So. That's one of the reasons why we don't do that typically. And for a lot of reasons, you don't need it. But if you're really looking at trying to understand in detail what's really going on, especially when somebody's doing these interesting chemical transformations that Amber talked about, you know, if you don't know what went in, how are you going to know what came out? Only if you have the, you know, that, that forensic technology she talked about, they have those fancy instruments to do that. It's, but it's not something they can do in a CSI episode. It doesn't take 30 minutes, it takes days. Well, I think the other thing, David, is, is you end up with a lot of known unknowns. Like you'll you'll see yeah. things you won't know them when you use that technology. Um, you know, more detailed. Oh, that, absolutely. Like uh, as Andrew and um, as mentioned before, we there's standards that we have. So, like if we're told, "Hey, we got to find a red car," we have a what a red car looks like. But 
we might not know what a blue car looks like if we don't have a standard for what the color blue looks like. So it's, you know, the standards are important. And I think the more detailed the chemistry gets, the harder it is for us to actually have standards to tell us we know something's there. We may just not know what it is. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up. Go ahead, Amber. Oh, well, I was going to clarify. It was one of the points I actually sort of skipped over in my first points. But um, when we're talking about, you know, uh, what is safe or what is not safe, what do we test for? Um, you know, we're talking a lot about cannabinoid tests, which is one. Um, there are metals tests, which is a completely separate prep and analysis and instrument. There are residual solvents, which is a completely different set of tests and prep. Um, there are other types of molecules that we don't often talk about in the cannabis realm, but phytochemicals, side reactions, you know, how do we, what, what assay do we use? What molecules do we look for? Um, you know, that's almost endless. So, uh, it gets, it starts to get complicated quickly and I don't want it to overwhelm people, but I do want people to understand that it's not like CSI. You can't just put something in a machine and get a safe you know, answer out the other end. It's it's not that simple. I think it's worth raising the concept of an ingredient standard. So an ingredient standard is different than an analytical standard. An analytical standard is your pure compound. You use that to develop your methods and, and test for something in an unknown. An ingredient standard is something that has been used by food regulators for some time to set specifications on what an ingredient can have in it its purity and what it can't have in it. Um, a good example would be vanillin. There's standards for vanillin in whatever you use it in, say a cream soda or a candy, that the vanillin you use wherever you get it from has to be of a certain purity. It can't, can only have a certain level of residual solvents and there might be some byproducts of vanillin production that can't be included in there. And that's been used as a pragmatic way to address this issue. We can't always know what all the unknowns are, but if we can have reasonable certainty about the things that we don't want included or that present a potential safety issue or, you know, present a purity problem, those standards can be developed and have been developed for, for decades in the food, food industry. I think you're right, Brad. I'm oh, sorry. I was going to say it kind of gets back to the scrambled egg situation. Like, you know, if the scrambled eggs are good enough, you know, there, there may be a metric that which you say um, a, a product meets a certain standard. Right. You think of an over easy egg. An over easy egg has to be runny enough, but if it's too runny, it doesn't meet the criteria for an over easy egg. Yeah. I wanted to add a little bit more discussion about the, I don't want to be the voice of the concern, but just to think about the potential toxicity and just let's revisit how the history has, uh, has dealt with that. The majority, the, in, in the past decades ago, individuals were mainly using cannabis based products, which were pretty moderately high in amount of THC and, and, and toxicity, we always have to think about what is the dose, how much is taken. So it is true that today, because of the THC, Delta 9 THC compounds that have increased in their concentration, there's new questions about the safety profile of, this, of these higher concentration. And that's for Delta 9. For CBD, turns out uh, because of the widespread use of all these products, it looks like just by public experiment, it looks like the CBD product is actually quite safe. I haven't really heard too many horror stories. However, I remember 10 or even still now, but 10, 15 years ago when synthetic cannabinoids, or I would say probably artificial cannabinoids, cannabinoid molecules that are very potent, very strong, were synthesized in the laboratory and give rise to products like spice or K2. And that's a completely new molecule, quite different actually than Delta 9, but an artificial completely new molecule. And then when these individuals were starting to use high doses of these molecules, we discovered new toxicity profiles. 
people that would go to the ER with some renal failures, individuals that would undergo seizures. And that was a toxicity profile that was linked to a completely new molecule that was starting to be used by individuals. So in this case, when we start thinking about Delta-8, and now we understand that there's four different types maybe, and we've studied maybe only one, we are actually encountering again this new situation where we don't know what the toxicity profile is of these other Delta-8 or Delta-10 molecules. Uh, I hope they'll be safe, but until we actually do the, the testing, we, we will not know. So I just wanted to emphasize this, uh, this view of, of not only we need to be able to quantify the amount of, of molecules, but we need to monitor how individuals are responding to this new molecule that really has never been tested before. I just wanted to add that point to the discussion. Thanks very much. Others, before we move on, we are already at 1030. <laughs> Nick, any, any other follow up uh, co moderator questions from you before we move on? No, I think the panel did a wonderful job with that topic. Agreed. And far more than I would be able to by myself. All right. All right. If nothing uh, additional, we will move on to question three. Uh, what amount of commercially available, so produced and sold, Delta 8 THC is produced from cannabidiol or CBD relative to the amount that's simply extracted from the cannabis plant. And um, I think we will start with Brad on this question. Thank you, Kathy. You're well, welcome. Let's, let's start by recognizing that it's impossible to know all the details of where the Delta 8 THC that's bought and sold is coming from in today's market. Um, and I have some insight on how some people are producing Delta 8 or extracting Delta 8. But instead of giving you my opinion, I wanted to share a bit of an economic argument here or some economic information. So between the two, so Delta 8 THC that's produced from cannabidiol or CBD or Delta 8 THC that's extracted from the cannabis plant, whether marijuana or hemp. It makes no difference here. If you produce Delta A THC from CBD, you're starting with a starting material that costs less than $500 a kilo in CBD. With a few reagents, you're producing Delta A THC for a cost less than $1,000 a kilo. When it comes to Delta A's natural abundance in cannabis and hemp plants, usually you're looking at when it's detected at a weight percent less than 0.1 percent. There have been some reports that it can be found on cannabis up to 1 percent. But even if you're trying to extract and purify an ingredient like Delta-8 THC from cannabis at 1 percent, the cost of production is significantly more than if producing it from CBD. So to me, that indicates and this is what some of my insight about the industry tells me is that most, if not all, of the Delta-8 THC, at least from these two avenues, most is coming from hemp or, or hemp CBD. And we'll, we'll leave other potential routes from Delta-9 THC or from yeast production out of it for just uh, these purposes for this question. That's how I understand the market. And Brad, I think one one point around it is that in general, hemp is much lower priced to produce high amounts of CBN just because it's a little less or substantially less regulated. Um, and so the costs are lower and the production field sizes are larger. Is that fair? That's fair. And I think that's another important point. There's a reason that Delta 8 THC is really mushroomed recently, and that's partly because hemp has become less expensive. CBD from hemp has become less expensive, been more prevalent, uh, more of it sitting around. 
Uh, so that the two are related partly because of this. Okay, others. Brad, I actually have a question for you. Maybe you can answer this one. The delta H THC that's produced from cannabidiol, is that going to be the, to, to use the language we heard earlier, is that going to be the left, left version, the left, right version, the right, right version, the left, right, left, you know what I'm saying? I do, that, that's a is, great is question. It a pure, is it a pure form or is it a mixture? Well, if we look at the chemistry, so the chemistry of producing delta THC from CBD involves at least a ring closure step. So right. you're just taking something that doesn't have stereochemistry at those stereogenic centers and you're creating it. So I don't have analytical data on the stereoselectivity of THC, delta THC produced from CBD. But what I know about that chemistry is that you're likely to be producing a mixture of different isomers. So it's very unlikely, and I'm not aware of any processes that allow you to be stereoselective in producing the right-handed molecule exclusively. Yeah, that was my understanding too. I want to make sure I was clear on that. I, I've looked at the paper that, you know, the technology that I, I have, I think is being used um, to produce it from CBD is relatively inexpensive compared to other technologies that could be used. And of course, that makes sense, right? Economics is going to drive this. So it's basically a dilute acid solution and it's something pretty cheap to, to, to get access to. Um, but it's also, like you said, it's not selective at all. So you end up with something that, from my perspective, should have been a mixture. I just wanted to make sure that I was clear on that. Yeah, and another point about the chemistry there, David, that's is probably important to share is that even if you're using delta 8 TH3 from CBD through delta 9 THC, the isomerization process also can, can scramble stereochemistry, so to speak. So that's another important part there in terms of the stereochemistry. But Brad, you also brought up the, you know, weight volume in a plant. And I think there is a a conception out there that that it's possible to maybe genetically modify the plants or selectively breed in some way to create plants that produce large amounts of de delta A. But um, I don't know a way. Um, my understanding is most of it is not necessarily dictated by the synthesis of the genes of the plant, but it's actually conversion of delta nine um, post production of delta nine. Is that is that a fair assumption that that it really is not the plants are producing delta eight the plants are producing delta nine that is then um, you know I summarized it as a delta eight and and you know more about this than I do do Jessica but what we do know is that delta eight has been reported to be found on cannabis samples right it's unclear whether the plant particularly THCA synthase makes Delta 8 THC acid. That's unclear. Um, but what we do know is that it has been found on some plants. How it got there, maybe it was produced by the plant. Do you know that better than I do? Or maybe it was just a process of isomerization occurring on the plant or through drying or processing. Yeah, I think the fact that we haven't been able to really identify these plants that produce high levels of it leans towards the post delta nine synthesis, but um, I might be proven wrong on that long term. Yeah, one, one thing I can say to that too is we've been analyzing a number of hemp samples over the last couple of years, and we have standards for delta eight. You know, on our technology, on the HPLC technology that we use, we use both that technology as well as LCMS, so a little bit higher resolution. Uh, we never have detected delta eight in any of the hemp samples that we've looked at. We see delta nine. You know, they're they're always below the regulatory limit if, with the samples we've been handed. Um, so THC levels are low in general. The delta nine levels are low. So if delta eight is produced by that enzyme at a very very small fraction, it may just be way below a level that's detectable. Or it could be what you said, Jessica. It's very possible that if it is detected in the plant material, that it is due to some kind of processing after the fact. 
So this question assumes that Delta has some production within the canvas plant. Let's say let's make the assumption that Delta can get there, probably not enzymatically, but get there to some degree, right? Um, I think part of the question is asking, do you, in any of your experiences, do you think anybody is just separating, so, isolating Delta-8 out of a cannabis hemp marijuana plant um, instead of doing a further chemical rearrangement? I think the economics from what we've seen in the plant, somebody just, um, made a comment that, you know, that the plant really does only make the acids, which is correct. Um, I think that um, when we're looking at the Delta-8, we've never we, seen it in high enough levels of plants. We have a pretty plant diversity library. I think, Brad, I don't know how many tens of thousands of samples that you guys have run, and you said 1% level. So, you know, from a processing perspective, that getting out 1% is very, very pricey. Um, I don't know, Brad, you, how many samples you guys have seen it? Yeah, to, to reiterate, when you do see it, if you see it, it's much lower than, than 1%. We're talking less than 0.01% in some cases. And even at 1%, you are absolutely correct, Jessica. The economics of trying to extract that and purify that from other compounds that are similar to it is it's certainly not competitive with producing it from, from CBD economically. Brad, when you measured at that close to 1% level, what's the relative level of the Delta 9 in those same, in those same samples? Do you, do you, Usually any idea? Do, you have, do you have any recollection of that? Yeah, relative, and I won't put percentages on it, but usually much more orders of magnitude. So these are going to be in high THC strains that are going to be available that you're looking at in order to see it at that level, right? Right. And if you look at those, there's only a few instances where Delta-8 has been reported in the literature as being found in cannabis plant samples. And in those, the same holds true, that it's found alongside of Delta-9 and in much smaller quantities. And I have urban legends, I don't know if these are true, but that some of those samples with higher levels may have had like fire retardant or different things potentially put on them. I don't know if that's urban legend or, or not. Um, Might be. Yeah, it, you know, you never know. I did it, tell a rumor mill that I've heard is, you know, some of them were maybe some of the Humboldt fire schools and different things like that. You know, I don't know. Any other follow-up questions? Interactions with each other? I wanted to make an announcement. It, it looks like there were some of our chat features weren't working to begin with. And I think, um, just checked in with Audrey, I think that the chat function is open to everyone now. Um, initially, I think some of the settings defaulted to uh, just messages being able to see by panelists, um, posts, et cetera. So I think the chat is open to everyone. So if folks want to give that a try, um, we'll see if those settings have been corrected. So just wanted to interject that there. All right, well, if we're ready, I'll move on to uh, question four. We can advance here. So. From a chemist perspective, what does synthetic mean? And how did this differ from artificial? And we'll kick this one off with David, please. Yeah, I, this has already been actually addressed a little bit in some of the previous comments. So I think maybe I can kind of summarize that. Um, I, I think I'll start with what an artificial means. And that is something that's completely new so we heard that from nephi talking about um spice and other compounds that they they bind to the cannabinoid receptor but they're not related at all structurally to the phytocannabinoids or different types of molecules so they have a similar effect but they came from a different place um and they are usually i mean if it's artificial it means it comes from starting building blocks 
that are completely different from what's found in nature. Synthetic can mean something that is made in the lab. Okay, so you can have, for example, that vanillin example we had earlier. Vanillin is the flavor of vanilla. It's produced by the vanilla um, orchid, and you can extract it using alcohol from the vanilla bean, or you can put your vanilla bean when you're making your, you know, creme brulee or whatever, and you get this nice vanilla added to your your food that you're your your interest in eating um, and that's the natural form of it you can also produce vanillin by taking um, lignin that you extract out of trees and go through some chemical processes and you end up with exactly the same molecule it's still vanillin but that's now a synthetic version because it didn't come from the what we would consider the natural source it didn't come from the vanilla bean okay it came from somewhere else it came from some other molecule but it's still the same exact molecule um, an example of an artificial molecule would be something that would taste kind of like vanilla, but be a completely different compound. Another way to think about this would be sweeteners. People are pretty familiar with sweeteners, right? We, we're all familiar with sugar, you know, sucrose. That's the sugar, the table sugar that we all use. There are artificial, there are some natural sources for that. You can get sugar from sugar cane. There are artificial sources where you could actually take petroleum and you could use petroleum to synthesize sucrose if you really wanted to. I don't know why you would, because it'd be pretty expensive compared to how cheap it is to get it naturally, but you could do that. And then there's this stuff called Splenda, which is a completely different molecule, but it's also sweet. So it has some of the properties that we think are important for, you know, being a sweetener, but it's not natural. It's an artificial molecule. It's never found in nature. It's completely new. It just happens to have some of the same kind of functions. Red food colorings are the same. They're natural red food colorings that come from beets, some of them come from beetles, from the Andes, and some of them are made in a lab that are not natural, that are completely artificial, that are different structures, but they give you the red color. And I think with the cannabinoids, it's the same kind of thing. It's, do you have something that is the same molecule that's found in the plant that you make at the lab, that would be synthetic, or is it something that binds to the receptor and has a similar kind of function in the body, but it's a completely different molecule and was made up in the lab from scratch, that would be something that would be artificial. I, don't, I hope that's a good explanation for the differences. Agreed, others. Maybe I can I can add to that. So if we come back to the um, analogy of the hands, is it, do I understand well that there's only one delta H THC that is produced by the plant? And then the other delta eight THCs that have other conformations, actually, are they produced by the plant or are they only produced in the lab synthetically and therefore they would be artificial? I'm not really sure about that. It'd be good to know. Well, I for produced my, by the plant. Right. That's a really good question. I think the answer to that question is we don't know. Nobody has really looked in great detail to try to find those other molecules, to be honest with you. So they might exist in the plant, they might not. Based on what we know um, biochemically of how those, how the cannabinoids are produced in the plant, how the enzyme functions and how specific it is and how it only makes one version, one handed version of everything, it's very unlikely that that process leads to the opposite handed version. Very, very unlikely. Is it possible that there's another set of enzymes that we just don't know about that do that, that are present at really low level? Maybe. They have not been identified yet. And based on our knowledge of the sequence, the genome sequence, you know, what we, we have an idea of what the genes are that are in there and what could be, the enzymes that could be there. There's nothing that looks like one of those. So maybe there's a completely different system to make those at very low levels that we've never detected, or maybe they just don't exist. But until somebody really looks in detail and characterizes everything in the plant, we probably won't know. But I think the assumption is at this point, it's very unlikely that the other ones are made naturally. And I think that's a great answer, David. I, I might have a question for you. In, in the industry, and I mean the larger food industry, often hear phrases like nature identical or lab grown, referring to ingredients that are synthetically produced but are not artificial. How do you, as a, a, a plant biologist, think about phrases like that? Oh, that's a good point. I mean, a, a, actually, a really good example of that is citric acid. So citric acid is, you know, it's it's a tart compound that comes from citrus originally. That's where it got its name. Um, it's also present in regular metabolism in all organisms. It's in everything. 
Um, and it's pre but it's present at high level in citrus fruit, and that's why we identified it from there. But citric acid is added to lots of different foods for lots of different purposes. It's added for a, a tartening agent. It's also has some um, antimicrobial properties at some level. So it's also added as a kind of a natural food preservative um, for certain types of foods when it's appropriate. Uh, but we don't get it from citrus fruits anymore. It's all made in vats by yeast in a lab. That's where it all comes from now, because it's a lot cheaper and easier to make it that way than it is to try to extract it out of citrus fruits at this point. So it's the same exact molecule. And I don't know if I really answered your question with that example. I hope it I hope it helps a little bit, but it's you know, you end up with the same thing, but you get it from a different source. I think that's a great answer. All right, any other questions from the panel to each other? Well, I'll, I'll add one more thing to be to be clear on this. The phytocannabinoids that we're talking about, the uh, you know, tetrahydrocannabinols, et cetera, cannabidiol, they are restricted to a very limited set of plants. And to our knowledge, that's like one plant. It's the cannabis sativa species right now. As far as we know, other plants do not make these molecules. Very limited production, very limited distribution on this planet to that one species, as far as we know. Maybe that other plants make them at low levels. We haven't found it yet. People have actually looked. They've never found it yet. But to our knowledge, this is a kind of a unique set of compounds. Thank you. Uh, Nick, full moderator, wanted to check in with you before we moved on. Any follow-up questions that you'd like to offer up? Yeah, this one kind of just came to mind. Uh, David brought up the term phytocannabinoids, uh, which hasn't been used recently in this panel, but I, I think it's a great term. Uh, I'll ask kind of a two-part question. Is it fair to assume that both Delta-9 THCA and Delta-9 THC are considered phytocannabinoids? And would you consider Delta-8 a phytocannabinoid? If you're asking me, I'd say the answer is yes. Cannabidiol is also a phytocannabinoid. There's a whole set of, there's, a, you know, over a hundred of these compounds that we know about that all fit into the same general class. They have similar structure. They're not identical, but they're similar. They're put together from the same general building blocks and they're very similar in how they're produced. And they belong to the same class. They, they all, and some of them, not all of them, some of them bind to that cannabinoid receptor that Nephi mentioned earlier. There's also a group of compounds called endocannabinoids which are produced in the human brain and, and also in other parts of our body, completely different structural class of compounds, but those also bind to those receptors in the body. And that's one of the reasons why the phytocannabinoids are active, right? Those are natural, the endocannabinoids are something that, and maybe Nephi can go into a little more detail here if needed, but there are a group of compounds that are that the human body and animal bodies use to help regulate certain processes like sensing pain and other things like that. And the phytocannabinoids are molecules that this one plant produces that can bind to that same receptor. That's why they have the same general name of cannabinoid, but they're different classes of compounds. That's why I like to use the word phytocannabinoid because it is the specific class of compounds. Yeah, I like the word phyto phytocannabinoid a lot too. And I think about it just like what was said is it's produced by this plant. And if there's maybe it used to be 60 that we had 10 years ago. It sounds like now we've moved on to 100 phytocannabinoids. As we develop new technology, we discover new ones. But it's not because we have 100 phytocannabinoids that they all produce biological effects. Actually, from the current understanding, the main ones are delta-9 THC and cannabidiol. And the, there, there's some evidence that cannabigerol can it be driven? Might also have some biological activity, but the field thinks about phytocannabinoids in in terms of their biological activity. There's maybe a handful of cannabinoids that are actually doing something, and other ones uh, would not produce strong biological effect. If again, if used at very high dose, maybe there might be some effects, but not that we know of right now. Nephi, you brought up a good point um, that's worth noting is that, you know, different compounds can have different biological effects, you know, certain yeah. things you could take a, a 
dot of them and die and other ones you could you know consume your body weight in and be fine and um you know that gets kind of into the toxicology of the different compounds and also the efficacy of whatever effect we're looking for from a compound um you know the, the amount a person needs to take may be very different which i think is an important point very very true yeah pretty much everything taken at very high dose becomes toxic <laughs> it's all about moderation uh, the analogy for the endogenous cannabinoids that I use often is it's, uh, it's similar to the opioid system, where you have the opioids that we take as medications, as painkillers, but our body also produces endorphins, and the role of endorphins is to control our pain level. Uh, for example, running is painful, and therefore our body produces endorphins so that we can manage the pain while we run and we get a little bit addicted to running because we like the endogenous uh, endorphins working. So our body produces, and what, what morphine does, for example, is hijacks the system. So in, our, in the field of research, when we wanted to understand what is the biological role of the endocannabinoids, those molecules that we produce in our body, we think about, well, what does the molecule do uh, Delta 9 THC, for example, well, it enhances sensory awareness. Maybe one of the, or, or it reduces pain. So maybe one of the, the, the function of these endocannabinoids that we produce in our body, actually, it's not maybe, the function of these endocannabinoids that we produce in our body is to control pain. And those phytocannabinoids, what they do is they hijack this system. They add more um, pain-killing uh, properties. So that's a parallel for the for somebody who wants to understand a little bit endocannabinoids that are produced by our body. The, the, their function is quite similar to what the phytocannabinoids are doing. So I might add, if we if we're not running out of time, Kathy, there is a good question that came in from the, from the audience. And maybe I can help speed along the next question when we get to it. Uh, but okay. if it's relevant here, Gregory Foster asked, is the synthetic cannabinoid laws that we have on the books in different states and federally, is that more aptly described as artificial cannabinoids rather than synthetic cannabinoids? And the general answer to that is yes. Largely things like spice K2 are artificial. So they're not found in nature, not produced by a cannabis plant. So these laws are better probably referred to as, as artificial cannabinoid laws, uh, but there's history there, why they're called synthetic, um, but I think you're absolutely right. Okay. Thanks very much. All right, so I am gonna move us on to the, the final question here, and then um, would uh, we'll, we'll start moving into audience questions. So. It does look like we're going to go a little bit over, but do take your time with this final question. Um, and it is, are temperature changes and solvent use unique to extraction and processing of cannabis, or are they used for other extracting and um, processing other plants? Um, and, and this can be a Brad and David kick it off question. So either, either of you feel free to jump in and get started. Your choice, David, if you'd like to go. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'll go. I'll try to be concise. I think the short answer is no, that temperature changes in solvent use are not unique to extraction or processing of cannabis. In fact, these processes are used ubiquitously throughout the plant and food processing world. Uh, temperature changes can be something as simple as pasteurization, Solvent use, generally all the flavors, at least the natural flavors we have in commerce have been extracted by some solvent, whether that solvent is something you think of like a hydrocarbon or even something like supercritical CO2, still a solvent. Um, and I think that that's key. There's certain aspects, certain manufacturing functions that are applied to cannabis that are found all over the place. And some of these can actually impart chemical changes. 
uh, so we're familiar with cannabis, that increasing temperature or adding heat can take your cannabinoid acids and decarboxylate those to your neutral cannabinoids. Similar things happen if you look at oregano, it's a good example. Just by drying oregano, it decarboxylates. So you can, if you've ever noticed the difference in smell between fresh oregano and dried oregano, that's what's happening there. Um, those are the good examples where you're having chemical changes occur based on some of these temperature solvent changes, uh, uh, kind of approaches in, in processing. Uh, you know, other chemical alterations that occur with bulk processing methods occur through fermentation. Uh, that, that is chemistry that's going on there. Um, so I'll stop there, but I think the point is to underline that temperature changes, pH changes is another one, solvent use, these are found everywhere in the food botanical processing world. I don't have anything to add. I thought Brad did a great job answering that one. <laughs> Thanks, David. It helps when you unmute. It really does. Um, uh, any feedback from our panelists? Any any other things you'd like to add to what uh, Brad offered here? I think you did a good job as well. All right. Thank you. Um, I'll check in with my co-moderator here, Nick. Any follow-up questions from you? Nope, I was left speechless like the rest of the panel. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's a good thing. Excellent. Well, great way to great way to end our five questions here. Um, uh, we can move into just kind of want to weigh in with folks too. Does the panel want to take a little five minute break before we go into the open Q and A section? Are you okay to just motor through this and end end on time? Just want to weigh in with you folks before we move into the next next segment. I'm okay to charge through. All right. Same. Others. Same. Everybody okay? All right, so um, I, I'd like to bring um, Audrey and uh, Kendra into our conversation now because they will be um, uh, sort of mo uh, curating the questions that have come in through the chat. Some of them came directly um, to panelists and to you know others, uh, Tierney, Justin, uh, Jeff, and I. Um, during the session. So, um, I think, let's see. Um, so, we just got one question from Jeremy Melberg. I think we can get to that um, in a minute. But do we have Audrey and um, Kendra? Hi, Kathy. This is Audrey, and I hope Kendra is also able to unmute. I think she's been curating uh, the list of questions. So, Kendra, I'll, I'll leave it to you if you want to select which ones, and I can help unmute folks um, as needed. Great. Uh, so, for all of the attendees, again, as Kathy has reflected, we've so far through uh, this session been collecting the questions that have been in the chat and also in the Q&A. So as a starting place, um, we're just gonna take it chronologically um, by timestamp. And the first question came in from Michael Goodman on what does MALC stand for, M-A-L-C. And um, Michael, if you could, and part of it, we were trying to source back to the reference if that was on a slide or in one of the panelist statements. So Kendra, I think what he's asking is um, be, behind my name in the um, opening slide, I have a master's in public administration and a master of arts in leadership and change. I think that's what he's oh. looking at. <laughs> so okay. there's Michael, those are my two master's degrees. <laughs> okay. I'm glad Thanks. you had okay. an answer to that. It stumped me, Kathy. <laughs> Great. So, uh, just for Michael's awareness, 
Yeah. We have captured that in a spreadsheet just again, make sure that we're acknowledging and trying to capture, but in the Q and A chat, I'm just going to say that we answered that verbally. So it's got an acknowledgement there for it. The second question, which might have uh, been addressed was from Brendan Jeffrey. He asked um, in the Q and A section, he's asking about the stereochemistry of the molecule and being unlikely. So the question is, are you saying stereochemistry of these molecules is unlikely to affect the user experience or safety question? Or are you saying lab synthesized THC molecules are not racemic? Do you have concerns over cannabinoid stereochemistry from Brandon Jeffrey? For the panel. I can maybe start off with that one. I think what we were saying, Brandon, is that we don't know. Uh, we're, we don't have much knowledge as a scientific or toxicological enterprise about what some of these other enantiomers or stereoisomers do. Um, you know, there's been some indications that they may proceed through similar metabolic routes, but we're unsure at this stage. And I think what I was trying to describe with the chemistry is that you are likely producing a mixture of isomers. So it's unclear whether it's a racemic mixture where you're getting 50-50 mixes, um, but since we have multiple stereoisomers in here, it's not just enantiomers, it's likely you're seeing some of those, but again, we, we don't have good data on that. All right, others uh, want to pitch in? I guess the other thing I would add is, even though we don't have data on that, based on what we know about molecules like this that are, it's not a very complex molecule, but it's also not a very simple molecule. So it's kind of relatively complex. Uh, when when these are produced by plants or other organisms and then taken up by some other organism like a human, um, the right and the left-handed versions tend to have different properties. The example we heard earlier about smell of different compounds, carbon, right, plus and minus version, or different smells. Um, it would be very unusual for the molecules that have very different shapes. I mean, a left and a right hand, are, they look similar, but they're not the same. They're very different, actually. Um, they don't do the same things. And so it would be very unusual for them to not have some kind of different activity in the body. Now, what does that mean for safety? At this point, we don't know. We don't know if that one of them may be just not active at all. One may be active, the other one's inactive. That's one possible example of what could happen. There's some examples of that from from, from nature that we know about as well, um, where the body just kind of ignores it or secretes it and it doesn't really impact you at all if you eat it. Um, but there are, it could be that there could be a possible negative effect. The answer, like Brad said, we just don't know at this point. But both of those options are are on the table right now with what we do know. And maybe just to add to what David just said, because I agree completely what he was saying, it's always also a question of dose. Yeah, how yeah. much compound is taken. Maybe small doses will not have much uh, toxicity. Uh, but high doses might. So it depends on the product also. Okay. Any any additional follow-up to that? And then we can turn back to Kendra. Maybe just to a, uh, a touch of optimism. We have the scientific uh, tools now to actually try to start studying these questions and we should probably start studying them uh, quickly if they are making making these delta 8 thcs are making their way into um, people's hands and and they're consuming them we do have uh, some scientific means to study in advance if there's some toxicity associated with these compounds All right, great. Thank you. Go ahead, Kendra. No, we're just acknowledging that. And if we're okay, we'll go to the next. Do it. Great. Uh, so the next from the chat box came from, uh, I believe, Ryan Takahashi. Um, 
I'll tell you in a start, Ryan, um, if you have some additional clarification, I will tell you right now in reading the question, this looks more like a policy question than a plant chemistry question. I do want to put it out in the world for our panelists to consider. Um, and the question that you have asked is, what is the LCB agency going to do to protect the cannabis industry more specifically, the producers, so produce biomass specific for making Delta 9 RSO or distillate? The non synthetic distillate has been a staple for this industry. Um, I will offer, and Kathy is the moderator, I, I do believe that that is a policy question for LCB, and as many of our panelists aren't agency reps, probably not the most appropriate for them, but I uh, would also um, offer from a staff perspective an alternative to Kathy that this question that you're asking us is part of the reason why we've convened this panel is to talk about plant chemistry, um, not only for LCB staff, but for the larger industry to kind of understand some of the policy statements that LCB has made and plans that we have going forward. And I'll, I'll turn it to Kathy on that. Sure, thanks Kendra and, and Ryan, thanks for your question. Um, again, I would agree with Kendra, that is a policy question and we are here today to post questions to our panelists about cannabis plant chemistry. Um, so we're happy to take up your question at, an, at another time. Um, but at this point, if you do have a question about cannabis plant chemistry for our panelists, now's the time to ask it. So we'll we'll circle back to that question, um, perhaps during the rule development process or, or before that. Thank you. So if we can move on to the next Kendra, that would be great. So next came from Jeff Willett. Um, and this again might kind of stray into more LCB territory than the panelists. It was specifically for Amber. Um, Jeff asks, what would you consider to be safe methods people are using to make Delta-8? What chemicals are used? Are there any methods that use LCB approved <laughs> solvents? Uh, well, I'm, I'm certainly not going to say what I think is safe or not, and I honestly don't know all of the varieties of chemistry people are using out there. Um, but, you know, the LCB approved solvents are potentially possible. Um, I think it's a little unclear to me, um, and maybe this is already clearly laid out in the rules, but is of uh, liquid liquid wash considered a solvent um, because there's a lot of different chemicals that can get introduced in the cleanup processes or separation processes that aren't necessarily considered extraction solvents but could linger in the final product um, and it's not necessarily i mean certainly this is a worker safety issue potentially if the chemicals and processes involved are not being done safely and correctly, but also the cleanup steps ultimately are more important to me than the synthetic route to get there. Um, and how are you separating out those final products? How pure are they and, and what's left behind? I think I'll just leave it there. Okay. Thanks, Amber. Thanks. Okay. Uh, next came from uh, Rusty Stutterland. Um, he asks, or Rusty asks, is decarboxylation considered a synthesis for our panel? I can take that one. I think, and, and in discussions that we had as panelists before we, we came on for this deliberative dialogue, we had discussed this point which is, is there a dividing line between chemically altered and something that's the product of synthesis? And I think as the question is recognizing here from Rusty, that there are bulk processes that are used in food production that chemically alter products. So you are doing chemistry, but is that a, uh, is that a product of synthesis? Probably not. I think the key is trying to define that dividing line. When is something a product of synthesis and when is something a product of processing? Like, for example, decarboxylation. That's chemically altering a cannabinoid acid, but is that synthesis? Probably not. And that's, I think, one of the challenges in regulating 
not only delta A THC, but other cannabinoids is understanding where that dividing line exists. Brad, I think you're completely right in the sense that it, you know, it, it makes it from a regulatory, the science isn't, um, you know, black and white. There's, there's a lot of kind of gray that makes it a little bit interesting from a regulatory perspective. And, and we're not here about regulatory, but, you know, from a, the science isn't crystal clear, if that makes sense. Yeah, and that's a good point, Jessica. I'm, I'm a synthetic chemist, right? So if you ask me what what does synthesis entail, sure, in some cases you're decarboxylating. That's a synthetic step. I mean, it's a decomposition step, but it's a it's a chemical step. It's part of my synthesis. But in other cases, if I'm just adding heat, then that's not intentional synthesis. So it's there's no bright line answer here. Um, just a lot of challenges in defining it, even from a scientific standpoint, as you mentioned, Jess. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and to those um, who have asked these questions, please know that if I misrepresent the question, we can definitely take you off mute and there's opportunities for additional calls. This is just trying to stay organized here as we go through. So it, the next question was from Claire Stenerson. And she was looking for some additional clarification about the conversations that we've had about handedness. So her question really is to clarify for the more common cannabinoids, THC, CBD as examples, are there only one handed naturally occurring molecules? So other handed CBD would be considered artificial possibly uh, and I believe the panel has kind of circled this question, but um, Claire was asking for some additional clarification. I think this is along the lines of the question that I had to David. Maybe you can summarize what you said again, David. Yeah, I, I think the answer there is that so if we follow that analogy of hands and gloves. If, if you're talking right-handed gloves, if all you find in nature is a right-handed glove and you look all over the world and all you pick up are right-handed gloves, and then somebody shows up and said, here's a left-handed one, where did that one come from? Well, it could be that you just didn't look hard enough and it does exist in nature. We just don't know yet that it exists in nature. Or it could be that they made an artificial glove, an artificial left-handed glove, and it's different. Right, so and until it's been identified in a natural source, if it's never been identified in a natural source, then it would be considered artificial. But once it's found in a natural source, it's no longer really considered artificial. It would be, I mean, maybe it was synthesized earlier, but if it is the same exact molecule and it's in a natural source, then it is a natural molecule. It's no longer, it would no longer be considered artificial. I could maybe add a bit to that as well. I, I think also the question was asking, are there different stereochemistry concerns depending on the cannabinoid? And the answer is yes. So CBD, THCs, they all have two stereogenic centers at the six, seven, eight positions. There's other cannabinoids like CBN that don't have stereochemistry or stereocenters in those positions. They have other concerns like cis-trans isomerism but I guess my point is that there are different stereochemical con concerns for different cannabinoids. Any additional follow-up from anyone on that question? All right. Uh, thank you all. And to Kathy, um, in that similar time vein, in the chat box had been Greg Foster's questions around artificial and synthetic, which I do think we've already tackled through Brad, but I do just want to touch there for the panelists if they had any additional follow up um, <clears throat> that they had thought of later. The question from Greg initially was following the explanation of artificial and synthetic. He says, 
this explanation of artificial versus synthetic is very useful and seems to indicate that the law on synthetic cannabinoid examples of spice or cake two is actually about artificial cannabinoids. Uh, Brad and others talk, tackled this a little bit earlier, but just checking in if there was any other detail that panelists would like to offer under that question. I think Brad did a good job of going over. I don't know if anyone else has any other comments. He did a pretty good job. Well, one, one thought I had actually after I saw that question pop up is that it is possible to make a synthetic Delta 9 THC if you don't extract it from the plant, but you make it in a lab. And my understanding, you know, like we said, we're not talking policy here, but my understanding from the law is a lot of cases, the way it's worded is it's the cannabinoids are defined as being extracted from the cannabis sativa plant. Right, so if you don't, there, there, there's a possibility if the law is only defining cannabinoids that are regulated in that way, that they're extracted from the plant, then somebody could make them artificially in the lab or synthetically in the lab and end up with the same molecule, in which case it's no longer an artificial molecule, it's, it's the synthetic version, but they could potentially skirt the law by doing that. And the law was written in a way so they can't do that. That's why synthetic is used in the law from my understanding. And so delta 9 THC is delta 9 THC, whether you get it from a plant or you make it from other molecules in a lab, at least from the regulatory perspective, my understanding of that. Like I said, whether, you know, we're not really talking about how those decisions were made, but that's just my understanding. I don't know if anybody could correct me on that or if that makes sense. I just, I just want to add, uh, having had a schedule one license, federal schedule one license for 20 years at the University of Washington, and receiving cannabinoid compounds from NIH to do our research. The, uh, the definition of cannabinoids has twofold, and that I think is where the challenge is. The first definition is because it's produced by the cannabis plant, and therefore those 100 phytocannabinoids are regulated as the Schedule I compound. But there's additional cannabinoids that are added to that definition and those are for example the cannabinoids uh, that are in space uh, in spice jwh 0118 is the synthetic compound and those are on schedule one federal license because not because they're produced from the plant but but because they produce psychotropic effects they have the activity of cannabinoids so at least at the federal level on the schedule one license uh, list of cannabinoids we have these phytocannabinoids as an ensemble, maybe 10% of them that are bioactive. And then these other cannabinoids that are synthetic and they are, or artificial, that, and they produce very strong cannabinomimetic effects. So I think this is where the ambiguity is, is that whether th there needs to be some thought of how to define these compounds, not only by their chemical structure, but probably more challenging definition by their biological activity. Well, and I, I, I think you're right, Nephi, and, you know, to just add like a little bit more complication to the issue of synthetic THC, drahabinol, I think is schedule three as a prescription. So, you know, when you look at, when you look at this, you know, we have prescriptions, we have plants, we have others, you know, it's kind of, regulatory perspective, there's very different tracks that have kind of all collided, making it really complicated. Um, and the science doesn't always follow the policy or the policy follows science. I'm not really sure which way, but it complicates it a lot. Um, do you mind if I jump in here, Kendra? I received a question just as the the host at about 1030. I don't know what timestamp you're looking at right now. Yep, so I was just circling back on some of those, Kathy, to make sure we hadn't okay. missed, and it looks like we have one from about 1034 that I was right. going to circle to. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Um, so the question comes in. Um, it's specifically tacked for Amber and David, but definitely for the whole panel, because it's uh, 
surrounding some of the conversation statements from, that were made. This is from Brooke Davies. Brooke states, you had mentioned that our current lab technology is limited and made a comparison to an old TV preventing the lab from seeing the full details or purity of these types of products. Do the same issues you referenced exist for I-502 products derived or extracted from the cannabis plant exist currently on the adult use market? And she clarifies that when she says cannabis plant, she means plants um, grown within I-502 with more than 0.3% THC. So she's referencing not hemp plants uh, by that definition. And for Brooke, we will make sure that we captured that question correctly. Uh, if you have any clarifications on that, we can take you off mute. Hi, this is Brooke. Um, no, I think you, that, that sounds good unless um, Amber or wants me to clarify, but I think you did a good job of capturing it. Thank you. So you're asking if the, the issues we see or not being able to detect the difference between Delta 8 and Delta 10 occur also in the current I-502 market? Is that what your question is? I think just broadly more to um, the comparison made to like sort of the outdated technology and not being able to see the full detail of whether it's byproducts or whatever it is. Like, do those things exist just for products that are currently on the market as well? Like, is our lab technology needed to be updated broadly to make sure that all the products are safe? Or is it just specific to this kind of new sec sector of products? Um. I, I hesitate to use the term outdated technology. This is perfectly fine technology for quantifying the molecules that we are supposed to quantify. Um, the, I think the question you're asking is, you know, can we see, you know, I get, I get asked numerous times a, a year by clients calling up and saying, I bought, brought this product. Um, can you tell me if it's safe or not? I absolutely cannot tell you if it's safe or not. Um, that is not a test we run, unfortunately. Uh, and so I can give you a list of compounds that we are able to detect and at what levels we are able to detect them at. Um, and beyond that, I can't really help, um, unfortunately. I mean, I wish I had endless time and resources. Um, and we do have instruments in our lab that can do much more advanced chemistry. We just use them in different ways um, for our business. And um, I would also love it if people were able to pay us what it costs to do some of these more complicated tests. Um, you know, I would develop them if someone was willing to cover our costs, but it's tens of thousands of dollars to see a new molecule. Um, I have the instruments. I have very complicated, expensive instruments. Um, but to develop the chemistry to see some of these um, is time consuming and expensive. They exist in many other labs and academic research facilities. Um, it's not that chemists can't do it. It's that the ability for regular people to access that chemistry is very difficult. So to answer your direct question is yes, this absolutely exists currently in the market. Um, you know, there are potentially things that are not safe for us to consume that exist in, you know, products that are on the market that we're not looking for. I mean, I think if it was dangerously dangerous, we would see, you know, public health problems coming, coming up. So I don't want to scare people and say, yes, there's all kinds of terrible things in the product on the market. Um, but yes, there is the potential for things to be slipping through the cracks that we are not looking for. A really good example is uh, metals that we're not quantifying like nickel or copper um, that, you know, we're only, supposed to look for four, but not even in Washington state in all products. So, you know, that's a very simple example. There are thousands of others. Thank Amber, you. We, Amber, we also see, um, you know, in our research kind of selectively breeding weird plants that, um, you know, certain cannabinoids pop up that don't have standards or things that are also, you know, there's, there's a panel that we looked for and a panel that's new. Are they, it, it's available. It's just not routinely tested for because it's not normally seen at high levels. Exactly. Great. Thank you, guys. That definitely answers my question. Thank you. I made a elaborate a bit, and Amber, you did a great job answering. That's a difficult question. Um, but just to underline something that you said that 
even with a cannabis plant sample or cannabis product that's not the product of synthesis, there are always going to be unknowns. You're not going to know everything that's in that sample. And it doesn't matter how much money you spend to upgrade lab technology, there's always going to be unknowns. So, you know, it's from a scientific standpoint, perhaps an economic standpoint, there's always that balance, right? How much do you want to pay to know a larger fraction or percentage of those unknowns? And it's going to go to infinite cost to find 100% of those, whether it's just a cannabis plant or something that's derived from synthesis. And I think that question was also for David. Is that correct, Andrea? Uh, it was directly tagged for David and Amber, but for all panelists, just in general. Sure. Um, right. Yeah. Connected to some comments. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to confirm. Thanks. I, I really That's don't fine. have anything to add. I think Amber did a great job answering it. The only thing I would say is, yes, I, I hope people didn't get the idea that I said that the technology was antiquated and totally useless. That's not what I was trying to say, right? You can still use, you know, different technologies for different things. They have different places and different purposes. Um, but I, I just wanted to make sure that people were aware that the standard test that they submit a sample to is not going to tell them everything that's in that sample, which Brad, I think, clarified very well. And there's a reason for that. It just, it costs a lot. The more you want to look at it, the more it's going to cost. All right, thank you to all. Um, I've got a couple questions that span both the chat and the Q&A box um, here from Rusty Sutherland. So I'm gonna pull all these three together uh, to address. Now, the first question is for the whole panel. In the vanilla example, is it considered natural as long as the starting material is from nature? And examples are given like wood pulp, clover, rice, bran, et cetera. Um, again, I think we've kind of circled this topic, but uh, looking for some, uh, Rusty's looking for some uh, additional elaboration on that. That's going to be actually a regulatory question, how it's defined. It's not an actual scientific question. The USDA has policies on that for specific compounds. The FDA does too, depending on whose purview it is. I don't know, Brad, would, anything else to add to that? No, you're absolutely right, David. It is a regulatory question. And what I will add is that it's, it depends on where on the globe you reside. So our colleagues in Health Canada, uh, they have different regulations for what constitutes natural or what something can be labeled natural for. Same goes for the EU as the US. So there's not one uniform standard around the globe for what constitutes a natural compound. Um, next from Rusty, the question is, there is a lot of Delta-8 on the market now. Has anyone heard of negative effects related to the stereochemistry of Delta-8? And I guess partly it sounds like not even just negative effects, but ne negative uh, chemical effects. I think there's been a couple of statements to date in the panelists about just the lack of peer reviewed research. Um, so it might be more anecdotal uh, to your question, Rusty, but again, we can take you off mute if, if you'd like to clarify what you're kind of looking for on that. Hello, I'm on mute. You're off. You're good, Rusty. Okay. Yeah, thanks, guys. Yeah, uh, I definitely understand the part about the serial chemistry and the concerns there. Um, but yeah, I, I do know, and it probably is anecdotal also, because there's not a lot of research out there, but there, there's a huge amount of Delta 8 out on the market now that is being made uh, from CBD. And I, I personally haven't heard of a lot of uh, you know, problems are concerns are with that stereo chemistry. chemistry. So, I was, so I was just wondering if anybody, anybody else, else had heard different things like that. I'm not sure people are really testing stereochemistry. I've I've heard increases in 
poison control and things like that, but that may be, I, I haven't seen anything peer reviewed or anything. I don't know if anybody else on the panel has um, or has anything to add. Um, no, I, I'd say it's too recent. And I think one of the challenges is teasing apart what reported effects or adverse events are related to chemistry and what are related to mixtures of compounds being called Delta-8 THC. And I think that's sort of at the crux of this issue. Um, Stereochemistry is just hard to tease out based on the data we have currently. Unfortunately, maybe I'll, add, maybe I'll add, unfortunately, most of the time when we find out about toxicity is by following uh, the, the emergency room and, and finding out that people become uh, intoxicated, like what just happened with the, with the artificial cannabinoids that are sprayed on, on spice and, and, and K2. So, because it's a new product, um, I guess we're hoping that there's no toxicity, but uh, the, the field is not really, to my knowledge, the field is really not studying too much the biology of Delta-8, again, because it's not that exciting for scientists because it's just too similar to Delta-9. We get really excited when there's a completely new molecule like CBD that does a completely different biological activities. So, to my understanding, the cannabinoid field is not studying too much Delta-8 at this point. And if there's going to be some toxicity, we're probably going to learn from it uh, through the emergency rooms and, and hospitals and, 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 and those kind of studies. And to Brad's point, I think, you know, one of the issues is teasing out if there if an issue pops up i mean it's it's similar to the the vape cartridge issue um where you know it took a, quite a while to kind of get the samples and figure out what you know was a causative agent kind of situation and i think with with this there's kind of two situations and you know different people on the panel can can speak to this but the first is other things outside of delta 8 that are in the product and then um, the second is the stereochemistry of the Delta-8 itself. And so, um, you know, I don't know personally how, how much the concern should be weighted for one or the other, but there are kind of two variables to tease out in the solutions if, if anything, you know, is being seen out there. I don't know if um, Brad or Amber or David have anything to add to that, but. I might add, going back to the idea of an ingredient standard that I raised early on in the, the panel, and I think that some of these questions could be addressed proactively with ingredient standards that define, say, if you were to permit Delta-8 THC, you would only permit one enantiomer, or you only permit one stereoisomer, or you wouldn't, you would prohibit certain levels of potential byproducts. I think there's a path to addressing it that way from a wearing my scientific toxicological hat that doesn't rely on us waiting and seeing seeing what happens and trying to tease apart different stories we hear in the news or different apocryphal stories that we hear you know about you know people having adverse events. I agree with that. I want to second that. I think we have the tools to be proactive and because the industry and the individuals are starting to use these compounds it's for the scientific world now to use those tools and those tools and, and catch up and, and and make sure that those products are are safe and i think you're right brad you know there's very different quality and products out there and and it may be you know a path to, to setting a quality standard by which products have to meet Thank you to all on that. Um, Blade Bolden um, has shared a question that was sent to the to us directly. And again, just for those that are sending in questions, we are trying to coordinate the questions that are in the chat, the Q and A, 
and those of you who've been emailing staff directly. So um, I do thank you for, if you haven't seen your question, for popping it back up. And also just a reminder, if it's a product question, not a chemistry question, it might not be appropriate for the panel. So again, just acknowledging the process. For Blade, his question is, is there a clear distinction between a solvent being used for post-processing or purification versus a solvent that is used for extraction specifically? And I will start with the clarification and we can take you off mute, Blade. Are you asking if there is a clear chemical distinction between solvents? Who's that strange? <laughs> Kendra, this is Audrey. I'm not able to unmute Blade. I don't think he has, uh, he or she has um, the audio enabled, unfortunately. But Blade, if you have clarification, please type it in the chat. I think I understand the question. Well, Blade's perhaps uh, typing elaboration. Um, and I believe it's a regulatory question in terms of how the rules in Washington treat solvent usage at different points in the extraction and manufacturing process, which I won't answer. Um, in terms of a science or safety standpoint, what I will say is that in from that perspective, it doesn't matter where along the process a solvent perhaps is being used as long as, and if it presents a danger to the consumer, as long as it's not in the end product or they're in levels low enough so it's not a concern, then that should be the only issue. It doesn't matter where in that process of making that product that you're using that solvent, in my opinion. And thank you for that, Brad, and kind of that, that focus that you're bringing to that around the chemistry. And Blade does offer us in the chat that really he's wondering if the distinction can be made between the application of the solvent and the efficacy of said solvents at different points in the process. Oh. And it sounds like you've kind of addressed that as far as like how you'd be able to distinguish when it was applied and its efficacy is not necessary within the testing regimen currently. Okay. okay, thank you, Blade. Appreciate that we're functioning in the chat box at the moment. Okay, so next question for the panelists comes from Dan Oliver. Dan asks, uh, in general, Perhaps and acknowledges perhaps this dialogue is only supposed to be on the subject of delta eight and delta ten THC. But the question is, isn't it also true that you can chemically synthetically convert CBD to delta nine THC? First question. He also asks, is there any reason why that shouldn't be as concerning, if not more concerning, than the synthetic creation or conversion to delta eight or delta ten from a health and safety as well as market standpoint? So from Dan in the Q&A box. I mean, I can answer part of it at least is that, yes, it is possible that conversion exists. Um, I think all of the same concerns we've raised um, are also valid in terms of the different ways you can do that chemistry, the types of chemicals and processes that might be used in that process. Um, I think you know, if we had a very highly functioning traceability system in the state, it would be possible to utilize CBD from plants that were tagged in I-502 to convert that to Delta-9. It seems silly to me um, to do that within the legal I-502 system, given how easy it is to grow high THC plants by themselves. But I think what the question is getting at potentially is, um, CBD coming from outside of Washington State, I-502, grown hemp from wherever, um, and then converting that into Delta-9, and then potentially in introducing that into um, sale in Washington, which my understanding is not legal, you know, under the current system, um, and theoretically would not be within traceability compliance. Um, so, but, but I don't know how concerned, I, I have no concept of how prevalent that process might be at this point. I, I can add on a bit 
And go for uh, it. Go for it. I'll add after. Okay. Thanks, Nephi. Well, let me start by saying I'm, I'm a synthetic chemist. So you give me oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, and I could make you pretty much anything you want, given enough time and resources. Um, but what I do want to say about that is that it's the best way to answer that. Well, actually, let me punt. You go first, Nephi, please. <laughs> I, I was I was going to add a a different uh, answer, the biological answer, which is that three or four years ago there was a paper that was published, and I can tell you right away, it was retracted and and confirmed that it was wrong. And the paper was stating that individuals that were taking cannabidiol orally, it would actually transform into delta nine THC into the gut. That there was an enzymatic reaction. And of course, this was very concerning for many people who were trying to use cannabidiol as a medicine and really wanted to avoid delta 9 THC and learning that it would be transformed into a gut would be very concerning. But uh, to reassure the audience, actually, this paper has been thoroughly retracted. So currently, at least in our body, there is no known way where cannabidiol can be tra transformed into delta nine THC, and but Brad can do it with with his oxygen and and his hydrogens. Go for it. I'm done. And I will say, I guess the point I wanted to make is that it's, although it can be done, it's more difficult to convert CBD to delta nine THC than delta eight THC. We have a little bit more expensive and specialized reagents. And the chemistry to do so is less selective. So it's easier thermodynamically to produce delta-8 THC than delta-9 THC. So if you're producing delta-9 THC from CBD, you have a problem where you're often producing delta-8 THC that you're trying to avoid. Um, so is it possible? Yes. Is it economically viable, particularly if you had a standard of purity that you're working towards? Unknown, but unlikely, depending on the competition. Thank you to all on that. I'm currently just scrolling through chat and the Q&A to Uh, the next question came in from Lucas Hunter in the Q&A. Uh, there's two versions of this question. And Lucas, again, we can, I believe, and I'll check with Audrey if we can take you off mute to verify that happens. But I'm going to use the simplified question is how would the panel define the difference between its extraction and refinement? Further, is this distinction really important or should the whole process of creating cannabis concentrates be just defined as extraction? And as a caveat to that question, I, I will say some of the comments from our panelists and from the agency, this does look to start to drift into the world of policy on how a state or a regulator might define those things. So I'll turn it to the panel if I've interpreted that, that correctly on that question and any clarification from you, Lucas. Thanks, Sandra. Uh, just to specify, uh, can everyone hear me, by the way? Yep, loud and clear. Oh, oh perfect. All right, yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm more so just curious about the panel. Uh, at what point, um, if there is a point where there, a distinction between extraction and refinement really matters, um, uh, there is clearly a tie to regulation around this because of what the implication of extraction means. But uh, what the panel of scientists, you know, find is hard to not ask the question of: Is there, uh, is it always extraction, or is it extraction an initial point of taking biomass and converting it into a oil that needs further refinement to create it into other products? And just looking to get opinion on that, just at my own curiosity. Maybe I can answer that a little bit. 
I think that it's definitely fits with the, this definitely could fit within the realm of policy, what the state decides to define as the extraction, you know, put it in quotes, whatever you want to call it um, process from the from a natural products chemist perspective. Um, the extraction process is pulling a molecule out of the plant material. So it's that initial step of pulling the molecule out of the biomass. That's the scientifically, that's the extraction. Anything after that, where you're then going to purify it, that's then a purification step. You can call it refinement, whatever terms you want to use. But it's really only the initial step that from from my scientific perspective is really the extraction. Now, the state could decide to roll all of that process, the initial extraction, and then refinement of purification and call that whole thing as an extraction for, from a regulatory perspective. They could decide to do that. Brad, were you going to say something else too? No, you said it beautifully, David. Okay. I agree. Thank you, Debbie. I think that's definitely going to be a regulatory issue that, that needs to be discussed and decided. That's got that's definitely a policy thing. Because there may be reasons why, from a policy perspective, it's important to treat it a different way than how if you were, you know, just looking at it in the lab, you would. Yeah, of course. And I don't mean to direct it. There is roots in policy, but really just looking to get the perspective, not uh, not right. saying that what you say is policy. So the next three questions that I have, again, sourced from Q&A and from the chat, definitely uh, lean less towards plant chemistry, more towards opinion. So again, um, first from Jim McCray. Um, Jim, your question is, what do the panelists think of the equation of PC with potency uh, in current law? And definitely, Jim, if there's additional clarification on its relation back to the plant chemistry, we can take you off mute for that question. I'll start really quickly. Um, this is a thing I bring up over and over again. First of all, that the, the word potency is never used correctly in the cannabis space. So um, just using that word at all in relation to the percent cannabinoids in a, a mixture um, should be reduced if possible. I know it's partly in policy regulation language, whatever, but I do like to clarify that potency means a specific thing in pharmaceuticals. That is the amount of an active molecule that your body actually uptakes and processes and what we call potency in the cannabis space is actually a percent by weight generally of cannabinoids. Um, so to answer the other question, um, I'm gonna use another clarifying term that we discussed a little bit previously in this panel. Um, so potency being equated to the amount of THC in a product, again, this psychoactivity, psychotropic nature of other molecules is yet to be fully determined um, scientifically. So obviously there are lots of molecules that are psychoactive in the, in the cannabis plant. Psychoactive can just mean it's acting on your brain. Caffeine is psychoactive. Uh, CBD is psychoactive. Uh, anything that changes or interacts with your brain technically is psychoactive. Psychotropic is when it alters your perception of reality or some physical or mental state. I, I don't have the de definitions in front of me. These are like off the top of my head. So I think there are potentially, well, there are many molecules in the cannabis plant that are psychoactive. Um, some of them might also be psychotropic like Delta-8, Delta-9. Um, and so if we're only going to equate potency with amounts of THC, I think that is probably missing um, potential psychotropic nature of some of these products. Um, and also, um, you know, five years from now, we'll be moved on to talking about another molecule. It won't be Delta 8 and Delta 10. It'll be God knows what at that point. So um, I think I'll just leave it there some, with some scientific clarifications and no opinion. <laughs> Thank you, Amber. Okay, 
Uh, other two that are again pretty squarely in the policy realm, but want to acknowledge the questions that came in. Jeremy Moberg uh, in the chat made a statement um, regarding the LCD's regulatory authority. Um, the question that he had was, given the lack of understanding of the science and purity, should the state allow synthetic production as it currently does or ban it immediately as 11 other states have concluded? And Jeremy, we can definitely take you off of mute if there's additional clarification, but, but I'll offer to the panel, I do think that sits squarely in a, a policy question. Policy question. Uh, I might take the opportunity to, to reiterate from the science side, and again, my opinion. Uh, I won't veer into the policy side, but I I do see a path. It's it is true that there are some concerns or potential issues with products that are produced synthetically, but I do see a path with ingredient standards and and the proper regulations to test and regulate these products so they can be safely used. So that's purely opinion and based on my understanding of the science and toxicology, but I think it's possible. Whether that's right for policy is, is not for me to answer. I, I agree with you, Brad, and I think, you know, the one thing I'll say is it's not going to be an easy path. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions around um, science um, impact to other stakeholders, you know, different things. I mean, it's a, it's a complicated I personally don't think it's a yes or no answer, but that's that's just me. But I do see a path on how you could regulate it. Um, and, and if I could. Uh, my question is really to the panelists. I mean, is it is it comfortable to be talking about the science with so many unknowns um, at the same time that this product is already available? And and wouldn't it, from a scientific point of view, wouldn't you rather be doing this work before we were letting this out into consumers and for essentially them to left without very little information to work on? I think to be brutally honest, and I might get in trouble with this, so I, I have to pretend that I, like, please don't get upset, but I, you know, I've been in the medical marijuana patient for just 20 years now, over 20 years. And, you know, it's something that we've kind of always in this industry jumped off and then put some of the science behind. And I think that this time we're trying to kind of invert that, but I, I hear what you're saying, but I also, no, this is an industry that to some degree is has a history of doing this. Um, and I, I probably shouldn't have uh, said that, so I'll stop there. <laughs> I think I've been trying to find a, the right place to bring this up, and I think this might be as good a place as any, but what we're really seeing here, the crux of some of this is the separation of state-regulated high THC, I-502 in Washington, versus federally quasi-legal CBD hemp. Also, there's hemp programs within Washington state and they all are regulated by different bodies. They all have different rules. And now we're seeing them converge um, because we have overlapping molecules that are involved. I don't have a good answer for that, but it definitely points to if we had one central, say federal <laughs> rule making set for this, it's not going to solve our issues today of having D8 on the market already and the science like barely catching up, but we would have avoided many of these situations had we had much more centralized and organized rules from day one or it was never, you know, illegal in the first place to, to have and handle this and study it. I'll chip in with mine too, if you don't mind. Um, the the enterprise of science, I think, is fraught with unknowns. There's so many unknowns, and I think largely those that aren't doing science think about science as being exact and specific. Um, and I'll, I'll give one counterexample here that if we waited to know perfectly the safety or understanding of a substance, we wouldn't have any cannabis regulated systems at all. Um, so 
and I'll, I'll veer a little bit more into the personal opinion here. In my opinion, and this is me as a, a parent, not necessarily a scientist, if my child is going to go purchase, a, say, a Delta 8 product, for example, I'd rather have them understand and buy it from a tested and regulated system than some other system. So, again, personally, I'll stop. Maybe, maybe I'll add, let's take the example of THC products and CBD products. We had some understanding of what THC, Delta 9 THC, does to the human body and a pretty under, good understanding that CBD is relatively safe and can be used. And therefore, those products were developed and therefore, at this point, they're doing pretty well. Now we have a completely new molecule that we haven't really studied, Delta 8 THC. So the pharmacologist would like to take baby steps, small doses would be, because we don't have the data. If we have the data that it's a safe molecule, then of course we can generate products that have a lot of Delta-8. But if we don't have the data, then probably the approach is to be caution and, 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 and provide products that have low doses so that we, if there is any toxicity, at least we can uh, manage it and, and, and avoid it. Because we don't know what it does. So maybe starting slow would be the way to go. So thank you to all for your thoughts on that. I have uh, one last question that I've been able to identify and then I'm going to turn it over to Justin for a couple of follow ups. But this, hopefully this question here kind of ties into some of the thoughts around research and information available. This comes from Bonnie Jo Peterson. Definitely Bonnie Jo, if I misrepresent this, uh, will offer a chance to clarify. The question is, your opinion, how can the cannabis industries co collaborate to have this needed research conducted, right? So possibly this gap that's being spoken to about more information uh, that would, would help in these conversations. I, I think one of the biggest things I'll start with is research funding. You know, there's, there's two sources, or there's several sources, but they generally fa fall into, you get money from, some sort of government agency, or you get money from some private source. And the money from government agencies has been seriously lacking and seriously restricted in this area. And, you know, if you look at some of the larger cannabis research projects out there, you know, University of Sydney, for example, the Lambert Institute, that's privately funded. And it's not a small amount of money that privately funded that. So, you know, I, I would strongly advocate that, you know, one of the things that can help lead the research the fastest is funding for the research. Um, you know, the second thing that we have hurdles around regulation of this plant that make it extremely difficult um, and some arbitrary regulation around THC content that makes research difficult. Um, and, it, but the reality is, you know, we, we have hurdles in regulation and we have hurdles in funding. And I think the easiest thing that we as a community can do is figure out that funding component and um, run as fast as we can and push the regulation as, as far as we can. Um, and, you know, there's, there's potential mechanisms for, you know, when we look at all of this, one of the things that Amber brought up was heavy metals, for example. Um, you know, heavy metal research can be done on hemp which has less than 0.3% THC, are plants that have greater than 0.3% THC. And that research can transcend across both the high and low THC plant market, so hemp and high THC. And so there's, there's mechanisms by which some of this research, we can get creative on the plant types and how we do it and, and how it transcends across products with THC and not with THC, but that requires funding. So, um, you know, Talk to your representatives, try to get more, you know, at this point, hip funding, um, you know, if you're lucky, um, high THC um, cannabis funding, but also look at private, like try to figure out how you give money to WSU or UW or different groups to enable um, the funding, you know, contact David or Nephi and say, 
hey, I got I got some money. Let's figure out how you can use it in your research projects or let's figure out the best way to use it. So that's my answer and then I'll toss it back to the rest of the panel. I'll jump in and, and applaud what you just said, Jessica. I agree. I think we need much more funding, but maybe we can be a little bit uh, go a little bit deeper. I think there's two types of, of funding. The federal funding has very specific type of questions. The federal government that they're interested in and and uh, I think at the state level, each state will have their specific type of questions. So, I think it would be really exciting if we could implement a at the state level some cannabis related uh, questions that are relevant to the Washingtonians and and for example having access studying researching the products that are currently available in Washington state would be uh, very exciting and very important to do and would be a very different type of questions that uh, the federal government is, is trying to, to to ask through the NIH. So I think there's opportunities. I'm hoping there's an opportunity to actually create a parallel scientific research system where we would be asking Washington state specific questions that might be very different than what the federal government is interested in. Yeah, and if I could add, um, I like Bonnie Joe's use of the word collaborate here because research is expensive and it's very rare that one entity has the resources to just do it, right? Also, research is not something that one person generally does in a room by themselves. So, um, you know, I think to Nephi's point of having state-specific and also federal-specific programs parallel to each other um, is interesting and potentially useful. And I know there's, I have not followed this partly due to my busyness, but I know there's been some conversation about starting a Washington state cannabis and or hemp research consortium of some variety, either of, uh, is it an industry funded research facility? Is it just a pot of money that people can apply to? Um, many, many industries, agricultural industries have structures like this um, where there is fundamental research that gets done on apple diseases for instance on different varieties of blueberries um, you know there's different professional organizations that coordinate this and so that could be a route um, as well um, and maybe hopefully ideally it could transcend i502 and hemp and be sort of one larger group that you know we're, we're talking about more or less the same plant here it is the same plant scientifically um and to, to have these two separate boxes barely ever talk to each other it makes it even more complicated yeah and amber you're you're you know the two boxes it's really only thc that's differentiating those boxes so if we look at the entire plant you know 99.9 percent .9 of the things that are like interesting for a research perspective are exactly the same. And, you know, we all know THC it's been researched, we continues to need to be researched, but that's really like the differentiating component right now for us from a regulatory research perspective. One, one thing Thank I'd like to add. Oh, yeah, one thing I'd like to add, I agree with everything everybody said. Um, one of the things, though, that we have to be aware of is that the current federal regulatory system is such that universities like Washington State University and University of Washington have to be careful in certain types of research that they can do. For example, we can't grow high THC plants. We're just not allowed to because doing so would be breaking federal law. And so we can't do that and we can't take in plant material that somebody else grew because then we are accepting an illicit substance and therefore we are breaking federal law. So even though the state of Washington says that these things are okay to work with and it's legal within the state, the federal government says currently that we can't. And because those universities rely on very large, uh, to a large extent on federal funding for a lot of what they do, um, they have to be careful about what they do so they don't jeopardize all of the funding for everything at the university because they allow that type of activity. So we've been restricted on 
being able to do research projects that fit within these certain little boxes that the DEA and the FDA define are allowable um, with regards to high THC plants. And Effie can go into this if he wants to a little bit more too, but that's, I mean, at Washington State University, that's definitely been the case. Things are different now with hemp. We can, it's a completely different situation. There's a lot we can do with that plant. There's a lot of research that a lot of people would like to do in the state of Washington related to higher THC plants, especially with regards to what exists in them, what safety issues, there's all kinds of things we could do, but we just are still restricted. And I guess the question, come back to Bonnie Joe's question about how can we collaborate on this? Um, one of the things that I think is important is, you know, we, well, I gotta be careful what I say here about promoting policy, right? We don't want to promote policy or specific policy directions here. I think that's where this conversation, my, my thought is gonna go. And I think you can lead to that. There are things that we can do to maybe think about how do we how do we define how these plants are viewed and do we need to think about it from the research perspective and maybe a slightly different way than we do from a consumer perspective maybe regulation that is associated with research should be different than how it's associated with a consumer application and i know we're not really supposed to do a policy that's not really a policy it's a thing it's my personal <laughs> thank you all for that recognizing that that's the last official question that I've been able to source in the chat, uh, in the Q&A, and as far as I can tell direct, we're at 12. So I'm going to turn it, though, to Justin, because I believe that he stated he might have some follow-ups into Kathy on uh, figuring out our time and if there's any other questions that have come in. Sure, we can. Let's, let's uh, uh, kick it over to Justin for a few minutes, and then um, we can close really quickly. So go ahead, Justin. All right. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, and in the interest of time, you know, if we run out of time, I can always reach out to the panel members and, and follow up uh, individually as well. Um, I only have a couple questions. Hopefully they're short in nature, but first off, thank you panel members for, for joining us today. Really informative. Um, these, these discussions around the science is really going to help us and in, uh, be informed as we make these policy decisions. And so uh, I really appreciate the perspective that each one of you bring uh, to the uh, conversation today. Um, I'm going all the way back to question one. Uh, I thought I had this, and, and as a lay person and non-scientist, um, hopefully this will be a, a short answer, but when we were talking about, um, you know, the extraction, the synthesis, and creation of a new molecule, kind of a three-bucket area of, of these, uh, we were also referring to the phytocannabinol or cannabinoid, and then later in the conversation, that, that term came up again, and we, we had some discussion around that. Uh, my question here is simply, um, can a synthetic uh, cannabinoid that is the same as um, the extracted one, it's the same molecule, can that be considered a phytocannabinoid or is that just uh, classified more as a synthetic by itself? Well, I would say from the, from the scientific perspective, if it is the same exact molecule, and it is like Delta 9 THC, which is derived from cannabis sativa. It's a natural occurring compound. And it is one of the phytocannabinoids that define the facts of compounds. If you make that from scratch in a lab, it's still the same class of compound. Okay, and that helps. So, so basically the, the creation of the newest, uh, a new molecule, so completely, you know, uh, artificial, as as was uh, termed earlier, that would not be a phytocannabinoid. Uh, cannabinoid. However, a synthesized and an extracted natural from a plant would still both be considered a phytocannabinoid. Well, yes and no, because it depends on that the, the artificial molecule. If you make it so that it has the general structure, so from from a chemist perspective, compounds are defined based on the class of compounds they are. So it's like the structure, what is the basic structure of it? What are the major building blocks? So if you make an artificial molecule that has the basic structure, but then has some other pieces that are a little bit different, and those pieces make it so that it's not found in nature, so it's therefore an artificial molecule, but it still has the basic structure, you could, you'd still call it the class of a phytocannabinoid from a chemist perspective. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the key, David. That if it's found produced by cannabis or some other plant, it's a phytocannabinoid, irrespective of the source, whether yeah, it's produced exactly. synthetically or some other way, still a phytocannabinoid. And, and Justin, the other thing is, is that you can't differentiate that, like, 
by an analytical method. So you couldn't, if somebody brought you the two samples and said which one was produced by the cannabis plant, you couldn't, if they were pure, tell the difference if it was the same molecule. Yeah, that, that's helpful. So thank you, um, everybody, on that. And then uh, I don't know if, if um, Brad would have an elevator speech version or I can follow up with you afterwards on, on this, but you had mentioned um, uh, around the Delta 8 to Delta 9 conversions out of CBD um, that they were considerably different. Um, and in looking at, you know, the first slide that we put up with the molecule showing that the, there's, you know, such very close similarities between Delta 8 and Delta 9 on the compound structure and the, of the molecule, why is it so much more complicated uh, to create a Delta 9 from a CBD value versus a Delta 8 from that CBD um, uh, molecule? I think they really didn't it. take organic chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> I think to keep it simple, Justin, is that the delta-8 THC molecule is, is more stable thermodynamically. So it would rather be delta-8 than delta-9 energetically, and that's why it's easier to produce delta-8 than it is delta-9. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate that. So that well, those are the two uh, primary follow-ups that I had. Um, so I know we're out of time, so I will turn this back over to uh, Kathy, but thank you all so much for being here today. Yes, and just to, to follow up with uh, follow on Justin's comment there. Yes, we really appreciate the gift of your time today. Um, it's been a great discussion. Um, I, I think there's so much material here that I'm not even going to try to summarize it right now. So I'm just going to bypass that and go straight to wrap up. Um, uh, again, I, I suspect we're probably going to do follow up with you folks at some point in the not so distant future. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of additional questions that are generated from this discussion today. So again, we thank you very much for for offering your expertise on this um, very complex and interesting topic. Next steps for us at LCB are to, you know, as I shared earlier, try to curate um, some of the the content that came from this meeting today. And um, as we've stated in board meetings, and as we stated with um, when we issued our policy statement and when we filed our CR 101 to initiate rulemaking around this topic, this is step one of an iterative process. It's going to have multiple steps moving forward. Um, and because there's a, a variety of interests um, uh, involved around this issue um, and it's a controversial and complex issue. So um, we anticipate um, announcing some next steps not next week, but probably in the next couple of weeks in board meetings and otherwise. Um, but with that, uh, I'd like to wrap up for today. Uh, thanks everyone for staying with us an extra three minutes. We had hoped to conclude right at 1215, but I'm glad we're, we're ending at 1218. I don't think that's too bad given the amount of dialogue that occurred here today um, and the great discussion. So thanks everyone, um, have a great afternoon and hope to see you at the next session in the future. Take care all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.